everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're going to start tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we're going to ask Joshua Rios, our student board member from McBride High School, to lead us. Everyone, please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the You may be seated. Thank you, Joshua. Item eight, call for, oh, sorry. I think I'd know this by now. We welcome those of you who are here for purposes, purposes of addressing the board at the proper time in the order of their request. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. You may also make a request to give testimony on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda will have to be delayed until such a time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to individual members of the board or staff. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's closed session agenda. In closed session today, the board took action on two items. On item 3.2, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the board voted to approve final settlement agreement in workers' compensation case number 22888813 and 21851632. The vote was 4-0 with Dr. Benitez absent. On items 3.3, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the board voted to approve final settlement agreement and general release in OAH case number 20220805530, providing consideration, accommodations, and a general release. The vote was 4 0 with Dr. Benitez absent. Item 8 call for agenda items for separate action, adoption of the agenda as posted. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 4 0 0. Item 10, recognitions and acknowledgments. I believe Mr. Itson has something for us to see on video. I'm Vanessa Mosqueda. I'm a kindergarten Spanish dual immersion teacher here at Cesar Chavez Elementary School. This is my third year here and the third year of our dual immersion program. I'm Long Beach born and raised. I went through Long Beach schools. I went to Longfellow, I went to Hughes, and I went to Poly. One of the great things about dual immersion is that it allows us to teach a lot of our students' heritage language, where I think a lot of the parents of those students were denied that opportunity in school. And now we're able to really celebrate the language in school. And for students who are English only, who are coming to our program, it's really nice for them to be able to learn a second language through language research, we know that learning another language really develops empathy and a lot of interpersonal skills. So we're really um, hoping to support that social justice goal through language learning. We launched the program during the pandemic. So we launched on the computer and they are now in second grade, you know, in person. So it's, it's nice to have had um, gone through that and to see just the growth that they've had. Yay, so Cesar Chavez is one of our newest dual immersion sites. Um, and again, they started online, and here those, those little learners are in second grade. So grateful to have a homegrown teacher in our classrooms. We know that they're super effective here. Um, I did skip item number nine, introduction of student board member, but I wanted him to see the video, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so Joshua Rios from McBride High School, welcome. Tell us about yourself, tell us about McBride. All right, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I prepared a speech. Um, good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Jill Baker, and members of the senior team. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joshua Rios. I'm a senior at Ernest McBride. I'm currently the ASB president at McBride and in the criminal justice pathway. Thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share with you all. It is an honor. Before I begin, I'd like to thank our principal, Mr. Moraga, ASB Director Ms. Browning, my family, and peers who have helped me on this journey. We are a small school, however, our Wolfpack has grown stronger together because of it. 
We are celebrating our 10 year anniversary next year. With our team of students and staff, we are able to have great programs. I'm proud to report that McBride is one of the top schools in Long Beach Unified School District and the state. This year, McBride will be the first school in the state of California to have both WASC accreditation and linked learning certification done at the same time. At McBride, we have one-on-one -on -one time with teachers, counselors, and fellow peers. It truly is a great place that opens doors. There's no other school like it. Our three main pathways are health and medical, which is silver certified, our engineering pathway, that is gold certified, and of course, the best pathway, criminal justice and investigation, <laughs> that is gold certified. We don't have CIF sports, however, that has not stopped us. Together, administration and students have agreed and start intramural sports at the school, such as soccer, volleyball, basketball, and badminton, where we can compete with other small schools. This helps us build the foundational skills for our future. Today, we held a soccer event between teachers and students. This one event united hundreds of students at McBride. Together, we had a great time. This Monday, our rocketry club will be having their annual rocket launch at school. They have all worked so hard and in an incredible short amount of time. Next Friday before break, we'll be hosting our Snowfall Fest. This big event is where clubs come together and are able to have games, sell food, beverages, and small gifts. Our family is a team. We are also looking forward to our winter formal alongside the other small schools at the OC Fairgrounds. There's also a night market that a small number of students, advisors, and I are planning at the moment. This year, we'll be holding our second McBride annual car show. For further information to see how our school is run, we invite you to come to our site night, January the 11th. I would like to conclude my presentation and thank on behalf of thousands of LBUSD students, Ms. Megan Kerr on our school board president for many years of service of, to the Long Beach Unified School District. You made a difference in our lives of our students and we wish you success in your work at the Long Beach City Council. Please join me in a round of applause for Ms. Kerr. Thank you for being here, Joshua, and telling us all the great things happening at McBride. Um, I'm honored to represent Jordan High School on the school board and honored to begin representing McBride High School on the city council. It will be the only high school in District 5. So um, a dual representation in my blue today. So um, you said you're senior ASB president, which uh, means uh, yes. you might have plans for next year. You want to talk to us a little bit about what those might be uh, and what you're hoping to do? Yes, I've always been interested in becoming a pilot as well as civil service. Um, I have applied to a few colleges for aerospace, but my main goal is to apply for the Air Force Academy in Colorado. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for choosing to serve our country as your first choice. Uh, colleagues, any comments or questions for Joshua tonight? Um, just, you know, well done. Nice report, beautiful, acknowledging, uh, you know, Madam President, and also just that, you know, sharing that you're going to be serving our country. We do appreciate that. Yes, and thank, thank you. thank you for representing McBride so well. I know you gave a shout out to Mr. Moragas and um, your ASB director. Is anybody else in the audience with you tonight? Uh, yes, I'm my mother oh. and my Where's father. Where's mom? <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> You're raising a great kid, it seems, from our limited interaction up here, so thank you for that. Well, we appreciate you being here tonight. Um, you are welcome to stay for the duration of the meeting, but as we talked about before, I know you're busy as you're sliding into the holidays, and, and you're welcome to go on your way and celebrate and be with your family tonight, uh, but also welcome to stay. But thank you so much for joining us and for um, meaningful congratulations. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, I think, Mr. Grayson, are you stopping us? Okay.
Okay, we're going to move on to item 11. Public testimony on items listed on the agenda. Uh, we have two, uh, Maricela de Rivera and then Mimi Cow. Maricela? Welcome. I am so sorry. I was trying not to cry about this um, incredible young person. Is this the agendized item? I was not list being a good listener. Perfect, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, hi, my name is Maricela de Rivera, and um, I wanted to come and speak on agenda item 18.8, um, which is our recognition of um, Madam President Megan Kerr. Um, so if you will please allow me the privilege. Um, I met Megan at an event, a public event, seven years ago. I did not live in um, her district, district, one at the time, um, but I moved there because she was an incredible board member and I could tell that we would um, be good partners. Um, I was a community member, I didn't know her, I walked up to her, expected to be incredibly professional and tell her about my little TK um, bound baby. And as I am wont to do, um, I burst into tears. <laughs> and um, I told her about my um, my beautiful Rosita, and she did what she does. She listened. Megan's a really good listener. And um, she was comforting and empathetic, and then she invited me to coffee, and we had a conversation about my struggles with the district, and we developed plans on how to um, make things better for my kiddo and for all kiddos who are transgender and deserving of a safe, affirming place to go to school. Um, in my time, um, seven years of knowing Megan, I have been, um, I am most proud to have become her friend, but I am also incredibly proud to have worked on um, a number of projects together. One of them is the Wellness Center at Jordan High School. I am so grateful to have been represented the years that I've, since I've moved to North Long Beach, by a council member, I'm sorry, I'm anticipating next week, by a board member who sees the whole child. And the health and wellness of young people is so critical. As the mom of two um, diverse little girls, I am so grateful that she has loved our North Long Beach community. Um, a commune, truly North Long Beach. So far North, people don't even know it's Long Beach anymore. They think we live in Compton. Um, and she has seen all of her district. And she has poured her love and time and energy into North Long Beach. And I hope that your, um, I hope all those that follow you in District 1 will do the same. Because Jordan High School and Grant Elementary and King deserve the same love. You have been a mom and a mentor and a friend to every school in North Long Beach, including my two kids who adore you. And so I just really want to thank you for your eight years on this board. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mimi Cow. All right. Hello, members of the Board of Education. My name is Mimi Keo, and I currently work as a fifth grade teacher at Los Cerritos Elementary, which is also the school I proudly attended as a student from first to fifth grade. In addition, I represent the Jordan Elementary area as the elected representative on the Teachers Association Board of Directors. I've taught in this district for 22 years. I'm speaking today regarding agenda item 18.7, specifically seeking approval of a revision of board bylaws regarding the role of the board, policy 9,000. In the memo issued today discussing the highlights to proposed changes, the statement is made that, quote, recommended updates include changes in language to be consistent with the board handbook and to provide clear provisions to board members. And I'd like to focus on the latter part, providing clear provisions to board members. I welcome information, which I've yet to hear on when, whether, or if any board members have requested for their responsibilities to be clarified and by whom. This board rep represents uh, voices in all corners of our district community and it is the democratically elected and more importantly the ultimate supervisory authority for all district business. When I reviewed the proposed changes to board bylaw 9000, two major items stood out. In section two for items B, C, and D, 
board responsibilities are actually being reduced. Language proposed to be excised is regarding overseeing development of policies, establishing expectations, and establishing budget priorities. What is left is not creation of a vision, but merely adoption of policies, adoption of curriculum and instructional materials, and adoption of budget. And it thus begs the question of who exactly will be the ones developing and creating policy? Who will set academic expectations and who will establish budget priorities? It would no longer be the board and creates a more passive role. It is the hope that this board would not approve to reduce their own powers and responsibilities. Furthermore, in number four, item C, the proposed change is to no longer require program changes to ensure effectiveness and student achievement, but only to recommend. What is the purpose of such a change? Who benefits from reducing the oversight, involvement, input, and voice of democratically elected public officials? And more importantly, to whom would these responsibilities, if removed from the board, be given? I ask that you carefully consider the implications of these proposed changes and vote to preserve your current responsibilities in public transparency to the constituents that you represent. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to public testimony on, on items not listed on the agenda. Um, as noted, it's three minutes per person uh, with a 30 mi minute limit. I just want to acknowledge that there are 20 speakers in queue, so we may not get to all of them. Um, you are welcome to submit uh, comments in writing to our board secretary, uh, Letitia Rodriguez, either tonight or you can email them and they will be distributed to the board if we do not get to you and we run out of time. Um, first up, Robert Collins. Happy holidays through the chair. Thank you parents for asking difficult questions even though sometimes the district does not want to provide answers. I've seen parents ask questions about helping black children, Latinx children, Asian children, Pacific Islander children, immigrant children, children with special needs, queer children, girls and boys. Shout out to parents who speak out, who question, who make LBUSD better. As an advocate for gay kids, I've asked a lot of questions and had a lot of conversations. I've had productive conversations with Dr. Steinhauser, Dr. Markowitz, Dr. Lund, Dr. Brown, Dr. Cole. I've chatted with principals and teachers. Perhaps these conversations have moved the needle slightly to help queer kids. I asked to meet with the principal at my son's high school, McBride, hoping we could chat about how he was leading the school and teachers to follow laws affecting gay kids. Even though I have no interest in suing the district, I got a response from the district lawyer, which was so unhelpful, it felt disrespectful. In regards to a safe place to learn, Dr. Or sorry, Mr. Strumpfer sent a paragraph with a brief overview of the law. Not helpful. No mention about Alavea's program or how the school was monitoring hotspots. Is Mr. Strumpfer aware of Alavea's or hotspots? In regards to California Healthy Youth Act, Mr. Strumford sent information provided on the district website. No information about Positive Prevention Plus. No mention of training for teachers. In regards to the FAIR Act, Mr. Strumford sent a list of elementary books. My son goes to high school. Made me laugh. Then I was disappointed the district lawyer actually sent this to me. He also sent an old PowerPoint of the FAIR Act. Is Mr. Strumper aware that Ms. Secchi and Ms. Manos no longer work for LBUSD? My son's teachers are nice, and the school seems to be doing good things for gay kids. But I have questions. Have all the teachers received training about bullying, and are they aware of their reporting obligations? Are there any hot spots at the school, and is the school addressing this? When the principal observes history teachers and dialogues with them, is the FAIR Act part of these conversations? Have all the teachers who are teaching sex ed been trained in Positive Prevention Plus? Are teachers aware that during sexual education, if they talk about heterosexual relationships, they must also talk about queer relationships? I had a conversation with a history teacher at my son's school. She answered my questions, but the principal would not answer a single question. Do better answer questions. Our kids deserve it. Rolando Cruz. 
And just a reminder, if you have questions or comments, if you could direct them to um, the chair and not to individual members of the board and staff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, board, for your service. Uh, shout out to my husband, uh, Robert, uh, for his passion and for him being here. Um, I pride myself as being a problem solver and have learned that one of the best approaches to solving problems as a leader is to be open and to listen to all sides, to look through what I would say a different lens. That is why we are here to offer the lenses of two gay men who went through public education and now are getting ready to celebrate our 25th year of anniversary and have a wonderful experience in raising a son from birth who is now 15 years and a freshman at McBride High School. Our son started his public schooling at Fremont Elementary in 2013 and when we broached the subject of the FAIR Act back then, we found the principals and teachers were not aware of the FAIR Act. Through multiple conversations, we learned together that second grade standard was to, uh, to introduce the concepts that families can be different. A different dual or single parents, interracial, opposite gender, same gender as our family. Uh, fifth grade was to share the history of Harvey Milk and marriage equality. We helped where we could. We bought the books for the second grade and it just adopted in the district afterwards. And it was a nice thing. As we were visiting middle schools and fifth grade, we asked the principal at Tincher if they had implemented the FAIR Act, and she said no, but she was willing to listen and work on it. Our son then went to Tincher Middle School, and it was a great experience, and, and in his experiences, though, he communicated that many students were using the word gay in a derogatory manner, and we had a conversation with the principal, and she said she had not heard it, but she said, well, let me go look using your lens, and sure enough, she came back and told us, yes, once I started listening, I heard it, and it was wrong, and I asked the teachers to correct it. Our son uh, was then targeted with homophobic, profane bullying. We had a conversation with the principal and learned that the school had not conducted the board-mandated student sexual harassment education and training. She promised and scheduled these trainings. In collaboration, we sponsored lanyards for every student promoting anti-bullying environment at Tincher. We also sponsored bracelets and snacks for the Gender and sexual Sexuality Club at Tincher. Tincher wasn't perfect, but definitely made progress, partially as a result of our conversations and the principal's willingness to see through our lens. When we got to high school, we scheduled that conference with the principal to dialogue. In his response, the principal said we would meet. Then we got the legal response from the lawyer that you just heard about. We got nothing about what McBride was doing, let alone high school curriculum. Our question is simple. What are you doing as the leader at McBride High School to ensure that the FAIR Act is being followed? Board, I am requesting today that is it the right of a parent to offer a different view, a different lens, and have an open dialogue with the principal as the leader of the school to ensure that district policy is being followed as a school? Thank, Thank you, you very Cruz. much. Our next speaker is Renisha Love. My name is Renisha Love. I have a second grade student as well as a kindergarten student. 33 days into the school year, my kindergartner was suspended for hitting classmates. I graduated with my master's degree in social work in 2004. Ten years ago, I passed the exam to practice as a licensed clinical social worker. I am very well versed in developmentally appropriate behaviors throughout the lifespan. Initiative versus guilt is the third stage of Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. This stage occurs between the ages of three and five and applies to my kindergartner who turned five in August of this year. He also happens to be the youngest kid in his class. During the stage of development, children begin to assert their power and control over the world through directing play, exploration, and other social interactions. The major question of this stage is, am I good or bad? Although hitting is not a desired behavior, it is a developmentally appropriate behavior for a five-year-old child who is learning how to socialize in a class with 26 other students, regulate his emotions, all while trying to figure out, am I good or bad? The district parent handbook states many steps can be taken before suspension. I was disappointed to learn that my kindergartner was suspended for hitting prior to any intervention such as an SST meeting, parent-teacher conference, restorative justice practices, or implementing a behavioral plan. 
The district has an equity policy that calls for intentionally focusing on BIPOC and students with disabilities as a way of centering our efforts and strengthening the educational experience that everyone receives. The policy calls for implementing evidence-based research that highlights restorative practices and a lens towards reconciliation and healing over punishment for students on campus. Suspending a kindergarten student does not strengthen the educational experience, is not an age-appropriate consequence for a five-year-old, and is not aligned with restorative justice practices. Kindergarten is about social and emotional learning. I expect educators to teach children about self-regulation rather than suspend children who are learning to self-regulate. In my years of practice, I have worked with many adults who are unable to self-regulate. Kindergartners do not have the capacity to understand the magnitude of a suspension. Suspension is punishing a child who is still learning to deal with big feelings and frustration, especially within the context of school. It is our job as adults and educators to teach children how to regulate their emotions, not punish them for having emotions. My child has 12 more years in this district, so I'd like to ask, what are we doing to advocate for equity and strengthen the educational experience? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Love. I, I did notice staff member taking notes, and I assume that someone will reach out to Ms. Love. Thank you. Mari Salade Rivera, welcome back. Hello, board. Again, my name is Maricela de Rivera. Um, I am here in support of my, my friend, Renisha, and the work that I've helped with in this district towards equity. I continue to hear very troubling stories like this one. Um, I too saw staff taking notes. I believe that the people in this room care. I know that the equity policy I helped with with staff for a year is still being implemented. I know that it is revolutionary. I know that it is forward thinking and at my own school, my children's, you know, Henry, um, which is supposed to be a school everybody's supposed to want to go to, we continue to not see things change. And we continue to see things happen like what happened to Renisha's son. And I just, you know, I don't know if it's because there's a national labor shortage. I don't know what's happening, but we need to see these things implemented in a quick and expeditious way so that children are not harmed. And when I say children are not harmed, we have to talk about it. We have to say black children are being harmed in this district, historically and today, right now. It didn't end last December when four of you voted for the equity policy. It didn't end before that when most of the leadership were in rooms with us working diligently on this. It didn't end last summer when there was mandatory training saying this is our policy and you will follow it. The same principal who suspended this child told my black friend's daughter not to wear beads in her hair because they're noisy. So there's a problem and there's a pattern and when there is, it needs to be acknowledged regardless of whether or not it puts the district in some sort of vulnerable position legally or in terms of um, public perception, because public perception follows action and we are seeing inaction. And I know that that does not follow because you don't care, but we have to move from caring and policy into action in our classrooms, in our schools, we have to come to our principals and, and beg them, do whatever needs to be done to get them to move from listening to parents with defensive ears to partnership. I know Rainisha. She is everything we tell a black woman to be in this society. And her family is exactly what we tell them to be. And this is still happening. So we need more. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Loeza. Good evening. 
My name is Maria Luesa. Gracias por recibirme el día de hoy. Uh, el distrito ha hecho cosas buenas, debo de reconocer, tenemos wellness centers, están implementándose, gracias. My name is Maria Loesa. Thank you for having me here. The district has done good things. We have to recognize that. We have, for example, the wellness centers. Uh, durante los últimos 11 años he estado, muy, he estado muy involucrada con el distrito. Tengo dos hijas, una en la escuela Hughes y otra en Wilson High School. Um, in the last 11 years, I have been very involved. I have two daughters, one at Hughes and one at Wilson High School. Pero ahora vengo con un tema que me parece que es muy importante en la ciudad de Long Beach, sobre todo en el distrito. Estamos hablando de un distrito que habemos padres multiculturales. Desafortunadamente, los estudiantes no están llegando a tener el sello del bilingüismo. And I'm here now to speak to a very important topic for the city of Long Beach. We are in a district who has parents with multicultural backgrounds. And so um, many students here do not have the state seal of biliteracy. Para muchos el sello del bilingüismo es una distinción. Se ha hablado mucho de que es importante. Desafortunadamente, las escuelas sí están cumpliendo con el criterio de uh, graduación, que son dos años y uno más. Pero los niños que son nativos no están cumpliendo porque no está la estructura ni las enseñanzas como debería ser. For many students, the seal of biliteracy is a distinction. It is very important. And yes, schools are complying with the graduation requirements, but many of our uh, native children are not meeting certain requirements. Yo inscribí específicamente a mi hija en la escuela Wilson porque creí que iba a cumplir con los cuatro años para tener su sello del bilingüismo. Desafortunadamente, para el tercer año, ella tiene que tomar el examen AP, ya sea de literatura o de artes de lenguaje. I enrolled my child at Wilson High School with the expectation that in four years she would uh, attain her seal of biliteracy. But by her third year in high school, she has to take the AP exam in uh, literature or literatura o, uh -huh. o artes de lenguaje or language charts. Desafortunadamente, no va, no creo que ella pueda pasar porque no estamos teniendo la capacitación. Los muchachos no están tomando las clases. Antiguamente estaba estructurado que iba a tomar, uh, perdón, interpretación y traducción y también había terminología médica y de leyes. Para estos siguientes años ya no lo hay. Yo les pido que por favor integren a nuestros estudiantes que es, son hispanoparlantes, que toman las clases para que ellos tengan esa distinción. Es una distinción que va a engrandecer al distrito. Um, unfortunately, I do not think she will pass the exam. She, um, she will not uh, be taking the classes that she needs. Uh, previously, uh, students were taking interpretation course, uh, medical terminology course, and law terminologies. Um, but the next years, if they will not be available. A mí me gustaría que se hiciera un comparativo de siete años o cinco años hasta la fecha. ¿Cuántos estudiantes están teniendo o pueden lograr el sello del bilingüismo? I would like for there to be a study, maybe a seven year study or five years of how many students have uh, attained the state seal of biliteracy. A mí me gustaría que hablaran con el condado, específicamente con Leico, que él nos mostrara los números. También me gustaría que todos ustedes trabajen con los niños para que logren esa distinción que es bien importante. Um, I would like you all to speak to the county, to LACO. Have them show us the numbers that they have. I would also like you to work with our students so that they can attain this uh, distinction. 
estoy segura que los números han bajado mucho. Para mí como madre es una preocupación. Yo sí quisiera que mi hija tuviera esa distinción, no nada más mi hija, todos los niños que han, se han esforzado en aprender otro idioma. Es algo muy delicado y creo que ustedes son la, la base de poder levantar ese número. Por favor, intégrenos a las high school. Cabrillo ya no tiene una clase de español para hispanoparlantes. Ustedes son los que pueden volver a reinstalar esas clases. Las necesitamos. I am sure the numbers have gone down. And so as a mother, I am concerned about this. Um, I would like this, um, this distinction for my daughter and for all other uh, students. It is important to raise the numbers of the number of students that can attain this seal. Um, I know Cabrillo doesn't have a Spanish for Spanish speaker class anymore. Me gustaría que de verdad el distrito, el distrito tuviera equidad e igualdad. Eso es algo que se dice mucho. Entonces, yo les pido esa igualdad para los estudiantes hispanoparlantes, que haya el sello del bilingüismo y se levanten los números. Um, I would like the district to really show equity and equality. I ask this for, for the Spanish, uh, Spanish students. I would like these numbers to increase. Gracias. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, can I just um, raise an um, observation? Uh, I know it's very challenging to do interpretation um, in this fashion if, because it's, we're not getting um, real-time interpretation. I don't know what the technical term is. Uh, simultaneous. We're not getting it simultaneous. So I'm wondering if, uh, and, I've, and I would be remiss, I've, I've forgotten to bring this up in the past when we have um, uh, other languages being interpreted. Um, in the past, we were provided transcripts I think it would be important and it would give our interpreters a fair chance to fully capture. Um, so if there is a way to you know, make a consideration for the board members to receive transcripts uh, of the public comment, um, I, I just think it's hard to capture all the nuances of, you know, on the spot of what's being done in a public comment in three minutes. I apologize for the interruption, uh, Madam President. No, thank you, I appreciate uh, the point of clarification. Uh, next speaker, Stephen Paez. Good evening, board. Thank you for having me. My name is Stephen Paez. I am a missionary in the city of, in the LA County. Um, it was brought to my attention that there is being put a wellness center or a, under the guise of Planned Parenthood inside of Jordan High School. And I came here uh, to plead with you as a, stu as a young man who himself had an abortion with a girl and it ruined my life. And my life fell apart. And if there's access to an abortion, I got three young girls. And if they grew up and they made a mistake and they thought they could fix it by going to this place at their school and getting referred out for an abortion, I would be devastated as a grandfather. And so I've come here today to beg with you guys, to plead with you guys, please don't move forward with this. I know it might have already been approved, but we have a proposal coming where we can actually see about getting it stopped. There's already an equity center nearby. I mean, there's no need to have this inside of a high school. And my heart is broken hearing about all this agenda about the LGBT stuff being pushed in the schools. Let the parents tell their kids about that. Let the parents be the ones to decide to tell them what's going on with that. I don't want my second graders, my third graders to be reading about that. I want them to learn math. I want them to learn what's going on in the schools. They, let's talk about education. Let's talk about history. Let's tell them about George Washington. Let's tell them about, about what great country we're in. But most importantly, if you hear nothing that I've said, I've come here to share, do you guys know where you're going when you die? Do you know the one, the creator, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? Because the Bible says that it's appointed for man once to die and then comes the judgment. And Jesus was very narrow. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so if you don't know him today, I beg of you to cry out to him, to make him your Lord and Savior. I want to save some time for these guys. Albert, why don't you, you want to finish my minute? You know, we're going to go in the order that's on the paper, sir. Okay, Thank well you. then, like I was saying, the Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then comes the judgment. And it's either heaven or it's hell. 
and we're going to give an account to what we did in this time. You guys have been given the authority in this school district over these kids and what is peddled to them and what is given to them. And we're going to answer to God for that. And he says it is better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck than to offend one of these little ones. That's what he says in his word. That's the kind of accountability that we are going to have one day. And this life is but a vapor. It is here one moment and gone the next. I don't know if you guys know anybody that's died recently. Unexpectedly, we are not promised tomorrow. And these kids' futures are in your hands. And that is a high, high calling. So we pray for you guys. We love you guys. We don't hate you guys. We pray that you make the best decision and you wouldn't go forward with this well-being, Planned Parenthood inside the high school. Thank you. I'll, I'll just remind audience members if um, we could be respectful of the speaker um, and not call out uh, while people are speaking. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Maria Bosch. Hello, my name is actually Stephanie Perez. Um, I am a. Are you are you listed as a speaker? Yes. Um, hang on for one second, please. Yes. Yes, we switched. Okay, we're going to go in the order. So if you want to give up your seat, um, Ms. Ms. Bosch, you can. Yeah. But we're going to proceed to to speaker number eight. Then we're not going to jump around because we take we take the speakers in the order that they're received. So we number them as they come in. I yield my time to her. I yield my time to her. Are you Ms. Bosch? Yes. Okay. So if you're going to yield your time, I'm going to move on to speaker number eight, who is Tim Clement. She cannot. Um, if, if, let me reread what we do at the beginning here. Um, you may also get, make a request to give testimony on an item not listed on the agenda. Um, fill out a form indicating your name in the agenda item with which you wish to address. So as you turn in your papers, we number them accordingly because we do have a time limit. So if number seven, Ms. Bosch is not going to speak. She I doesn't have speak. to speak, I, I but we're going to move in the order of the comments received. I will speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you for allowing me to come today to speak to you board members. I am a grandmother. I am a mother of four grown children, a grandmother of 11 children, and a great-grandmother of two boys. I beg of you, I have seen many changes on our school districts to the worst. Our children are not being taken care of educational. They are learning things they are not supposed to be learning. The parents should have the right to teach them. We have high taxes in California to allow you to have your jobs. We pay for your wages. And we are very, very concerned about what's going on in our schools. And this has really taken a toll on our way of living because we have to worry about our children being in a school where they are taking birth control without our knowledge. They're taking condoms, supposedly, to protect them from sexual transmitted diseases, which is not true. And these pills that they're taking for birth control, they're causing cancer on our children. They're causing many diseases on their birth, on their, on their um, organs, and they also are having a great, great regrets. Because some of our children are growing with this so-called protection, and some of them will not be able to bear children. I know for a fact People that I know personally, they had taken this birth control for many years and they were not able to have babies. You are killing one, these people, they are so-called health care for women. They don't care about women. They actually, I believe they hate women because they are putting them in danger. They are causing them many diseases, and they are prolonging this 
so-called agenda of Planned Parenthood that are being very, very deceiving to our children. The board does not have the right to put these Planned Parenthoods in our school because we taxpayers pay for the schools. And we, as parents and grandparents, can teach our children to be responsible sexually and socially. My children are very successful. I have no problem with them because I taught them right. Why don't you get advocates in the school to teach them right? Thank you, Ms. Bosch. Your time is up. I'm going to ask Dr. Simon for some clarification as we move forward um, for a point of uh, transparency and clarification about the information that's been said. Um, so just in short, uh, thank you for those who have come out to right, speak. Um, but I will say as far as the well-being center um, that is being placed in, at Jordan High School, uh, the well-being center is a center that provides uh, substance abuse prevention, resources, provides parent education around sexual health, um, delves into uh, sexual health as well, and also provides mental health services right for our students as well. Uh, the portion with uh, a DPH, which they provide the wellness centers, the well-being centers, excuse me, and they provide it, they've provided well-being centers in about 37 uh, high schools in LA County. Uh, they do partner with uh, Planned Parenthood, but let me just say this very um, carefully. They do not provide abortions. It is not an abortion clinic, nor is it a medical clinic. Do they provide preventative care? Absolutely. Do they have conversations with students about making the best sexual choices? Um, yes, that is a part of the education and is also a part of the California Healthy Youth Act as well. Um, so their services are, are, are mostly preventative and also help our students if they do uh, have an STI and what those options are. And so in short, um, the well-being centers are for our students to access. We always talk about, and I'm going to say this, do our students have access to the most need and the most care? And for us, when we looked at uh, North Long Beach, um, we saw it as um, an equity issue as far as the access that our students have to mental health um, and also to uh, sexual health care. That said, we know that our students, ages 12 and up, can go anywhere to receive these services. We feel it as a safe, confidential place for our students to go that won't breach their confidentiality. And again, for them to receive the support and need as well. And what better place than to have that at a school site to where they don't have to leave. Please don't interrupt the speakers. Please don't interrupt the speaker. Thank you. It's where they don't have to leave the school site to receive that care as well, board member Kerr. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Simon. We have time. We're at the 24 minute mark. So we have time for a couple of more speakers. Next speaker, Tim Clement. Tim Clement. I'm with uh, Survivors of the Abortion Holocaust. Um, I want to address this thing that you were just talking about, ma'am, uh, this wellness center. That please direct you your comments to the chair, please. Yeah. Thank you. Ma'ams, misters, there you go. Um, I'd like to address this, uh, this, uh, this well-being um, center. It's uh, a disguise. That's what it is. It's a disguise, and that's why all these people here are up in arms, and they're upset because they all know what Planned Parenthood is. Yeah. Planned Parenthood is the number one abortion clinic in America, and it has been for a while under uh, Margaret Sanger. She brought the first one in New York, which I was at last month, and I seen a man go in, bring his um, girlfriend to that place to drop her off, and he had no idea when I talked to him what they actually did inside until I started showing him pictures. And uh, these are the kind of pictures and kind of things that Planned Parenthood does. Yeah, those are, that's victim imagery. It's the same kind of stuff that um, was happening in the Holocaust in Germany, and people just let it happen in their backyard. This is Harriet right here. 
full tri trimester, could have survived outside the womb. But she was found in D.C. She was found, she was found, and she was found dead, murdered, with one eye open, looking for justice. And I'm telling you right now, the public school system is supposed to be a place, a place where parents can partner with the school system to educate, partner that is, not play God, not play God and make decisions on making a well-being place that's disguised to bring sexual education from a place that is actually teaching, um, teaching our kids, like, if you make a mistake, you can do this to your body. You can do this to your kid. See, this uh, needs to stop. So you're going to shoot yourselves in the foot. You're going to shoot yourselves in the foot because people are going to start doing a great exodus out of your schools, and you're going to only be left to serve yourself and kill your own. You know, how long, let me ask the parents here, how long are we going to allow these people to uh, uh, continue to undermine our moral values and poison our children? And now they want to physically kill our own or allow the education to do so. So, parents, they, uh, they're seared their conscience. You guys have seared your conscience if you allow this to go through. You've seared your conscience. You've allowed doctrines of demons to come in with CRT. And now you're allowing priests, secular priests, to come in and sacrifice our children's children or teach them how to. And that's really what they're all about, Planned Parenthood. You know, I have a lament, and I think it's the lament of the people. It is. Planned Parenthood, you're sacrificing our sons and daughters to demons. You are pouring you, out sir, innocent time blood, is the blood of sons and daughters. Sir. You are sacrificing them. Sir, your time is up. Sir, your time is up. Your time's up. Thank you. Our next speaker is Albert Huerta. This will be our last speaker. Hi, my name is Albert. Thank you, board, for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak. And uh, I'm just going to be blunt. Uh, let's be honest, uh, Planned Parenthood, I mean, that sounds great and all, uh, if like ser some of those uh, services were provided. Uh, but really, it's the parent's decision. Uh, that's whose hands it should be in. Um, that's a family decision. It's a family choice. It's been that way throughout policies and politics. That was a talking point, both Democrat, Republican, and Independent, that uh, it is a decision that needs to be made privately at home. And all of a sudden, this thing is given, this magistrate is given into the school system. That's ridiculous. So I'm just going to be honest. It's part of like this whole uh, conundrum of sexualization over our children. And quite frankly, we're sick of it. We're tired of it. And we're not having it. Um, I'm a father of four. And, um, and so I have something to say. Um, this is uh, this abortion push, so I'm just going to read from you what I have. I have something scripted already. And uh, this is a push in part of a large grotesque assignment by Planned Parenthood. There are plenty of local clinics nearby where women can get services for their pregnancies. Uh, planning a Planned Parenthood in the, clinic, in the local uh, uh, high school is repulsive and part of a bigger agenda, and we're not fools. Uh, parents are being marginalized, and you're the culprit by allowing it. Uh, like I said, this is beyond even having an abortion clinic on high school campus or a well-being center, however you want to manipulate words. Uh, sex ed curriculum, like, uh, like this type of stuff, all is, again, it's part of a bigger agenda, fits into a larger type of sexual education called comprehensive sexuality education, which Planned Parenthood has always been a huge advocate of. If you don't know the history of comprehensive sexuality education, it's like, uh, I like to recite it for you, as I think it will concern you very much. And if you uh, don't, uh, if it doesn't worry you, well, I'm sorry for your soul. Uh, the roots of sexual rights revolution that spawned the comprehensive sexual education movement is all traced back to the fraudulent, disgusting research of one pervert, and I use that word quite accurately. His name is Dr. Alfred Kinsey, and I think you know who he is as educators. In 1947, Dr. Alfred Kinsey founded the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, which is still there to, uh, to conduct what he called, quote, unquote, research into human sexuality. Kinsey believed that children uh, were sexual from birth and had sexual rights to sexual pleasure. 
a pervert, his hypothesis was that promiscuous behavior and sexual behavior was the norm among all societies and among all ages of individuals, except like a bad scientist, he used quote unquote science to uh, uh, overused word, in the, which is an overused word in the last year, to prove his hypothesis rather than following the facts where they lead. He wouldn't accept any other premise that uh, then that which he was already convinced was true. Most disturbing of all, Kinsey's findings were also based on the sexual abuse and rape of children by pedophiles. And you probably know Alfred Kinsey's book, also called Sexual Behavior, in the Human Male uh, in, in Table of 34 in his book, a book of which you, uh, parents purchase, keep on a high school shelf away from your children. Thank you. Your time is up. So this is Sir, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. For any other speakers uh, who we never didn't get to, again, you're uh, welcome to give comments to the board secretary or submit them online uh, for consideration by the board. We're going to move on uh, to consent calendar A. Move I, to approve. Second. So we have a motion and a second on consent calendar A. Um, colleagues, are there any comments, call outs, or clarifications on consent calendar A? Seeing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Otto? Aye. Ma'am, you're, ma you're out of order. Uh, we're in the middle of a vote. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Dr. Benitez? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote aye. Uh, so that passes 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, we're going to move on to consent calendar B. Can vote I to approve. Second. Discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, I will recuse myself from the second consent calendar as I have a potential conflict of interest under Government Code 1090 and 87100. SoCal Gas provides services to the Loma Unified School District and has in the last 12 months provided a donation to the nonprofit corporation of Ranchos Los Amigos Foundation, which I am the CEO. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And one abstention, so that passes four, zero with one abstention. And we're gonna wait just a minute. If you're leaving the room, if you could um, respect the business and, and lower your voices, please. We'll take just a minute here. Okay, we're gonna move on to consent calendar C, and I'm going to recuse myself from consent calendar C. I have a potential financial interest un under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees or the awardees. Vice President Craighead, can you handle the vote, please? Thank you, Madam President. I'll now entertain a motion for consent calendar C. Move for approval. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes 4-0 with one abstention. Thank you, Ms. Craighead. I got a little nostalgic with that recusal. <laughs> You'd think after this many years I'd have it memorized, but I do put it in front of me every single time. Uh, we're going to move on to item 16, our staff report. Uh, student outcomes. Again, a reminder that this board has committed to spending time in our board meetings uh, looking at student outcomes with our student outcomes focused governance. And tonight, we're going to talk about A3G gatekeepers. And Dr. Chris Brown is going to give us an executive summary on that. Good evening, Dr. Brown. C. Brown. Good evening. Welcome back to our uh, regular installment of Focus on Student Outcomes. Today we're going to be uh, looking deeper at A through G. So um, a couple months ago, we, we talked uh, in depth about what the, the California State A through G requirements are and how for students to be considered qualified for Cal State or University of California admissions, they have to meet the A through G guidelines during their time in high school. So um, I'll start with just a, a brief reminder of what those guidelines are. Um, and how they compare to our graduation guidelines or graduation requirements here in Long Beach. So um, to meet your A through G, students have to receive a C or better in two years of history, four years of English, um, three years of math, with, they recommend four, but three is the requirement, uh, 
two years of laboratory science, two years of foreign language, one year of visual and performing arts, and uh, one year of college prep electives. So that's the requirement, C or better. To graduate, um, the requirements are D or better, four years of English, three years of history, four years of math in Long Beach, two years of PE, two years of science, one year of fine arts uh, or foreign language, and 60 elective credits. So in terms of course sequence, our, our graduation requirements are as rigorous and in some cases more rigorous than the A through G requirements laid out um, by the state of California. When we talked last, we, we talked about the gap between the students who graduate versus the students who graduate um, with A through G requirements. And so the, the information you're about to see is actually pretty new. So we've known there's a gap and we've presented that gap um, between different demographic groups as also the fact that the A through G rate's only about 57% compared to the overall students who enter the schools. Um, we're not really going over any of that. This is new. So now that we have program evaluators on staff, we were able to ask some questions that we just honestly couldn't have asked before. We started to ask, where specifically are students struggling in meeting their A through G requirements? So the data you're about to see is, is I'm going to call it fresh. It's a fresh perspective, which means um, staff have just been seeing this data in the last week or so as well. So just kind of framing your, your um, questions around the fact that it's new for everybody uh, in terms of how we look at it. So when we think about uh, students who graduate. So again, we're not looking at the entire student body. So what we did is we looked at students who graduated from Long Beach Unified School District between 2018 and 2021. Um, of the students who graduated, 60% do meet A through G requirements. So um, that's not that our A through G rate is 60%, because remember we have students who leave the system, who don't graduate, who move to other states, we don't have their data, right? This is of students who graduated, 60% meet uh, A through G. 40%, that means missed A through G. 31% um, of the students missed it in English, 23% missed it in the lab science, 22% miss it in math, and 15% miss it in history. And we're gonna really break this down, but this was the start. The question was for us to start, which A through G requirement are they missing? So when you look kind of first glance, English is at the top. And I think we've had a lot of discussions around the importance of literacy in our system and how critical it is. And so we're, we're seeing that play out. So we looked specifically at students who missed um, at least one area. So now when we look at percentages, now we're only looking at the students who did not meet A through G. So of those graduates, we're only looking at the 40% who didn't meet it, right? So we're trying to see where they fall out. Of those 40% who didn't meet it, almost 80% of those students didn't make it in English. English was the leading um, A through G area where students didn't uh, pass through. Lab science was second, math third, and history fourth. And, and just a point, doesn't mean they failed English. They did not fail their English class. These are students who graduated, and you have to pass four years of English to graduate in Long Beach Unified. They passed English, they just didn't pass with a C or better to become A through G eligible. So these aren't students who failed the courses. Dr. Brown, that just means that they got a D? Means they got a D. Okay. It, it means they got a D in English. We, we, we'll talk in a minute about how there's different ways in math and science. Um, to get there, so, so we'll talk about inferences in a second, but for English, it definitely means they got a D somewhere. Um, so of course, once we saw this, we asked, does this pattern hold true for all of our students? Uh, and the, the short answer is yes, we see this pattern across all of our demographic groups. Um, however, we still have the gaps that we've talked about in the past. So this slide's just as a reminder to keep us focused on what we've said we're focusing on, right? We've said we're centering our African-American students, and so we're gonna talk about them in, in our board presentations. Um, so, you know, it's about 38% of students miss at least one area of graduates, but for African-American students, that number is 50%. Um, so we still obviously have a gap there, which is, commiserate with exactly what we presented last time we talked about A through G. Um, our African-American students are overrepresented in the group that doesn't meet A through G, um, and it's an area of, of focus. So again, this is not new data on this slide, but I just wanted to make sure we're staying focused where we need to be. But it was interesting, so we thought about this. So there's a lot of areas, right? You can miss A, you can miss A and B, you can miss A and C. So we started asking the question, 
how many students are missing one area versus how many students are missing a lot of areas because that will have implications as we look for it for how, who we need to intervene with and how quickly we can make changes. Um, so what we noticed is of the graduates who missed that we looked at, 25% of those students, 2,000 students missed in only one area. So they met all areas of A through G save one. Um, and then 18% missed two, and you kind of see that the list goes on and on in there. So, so by and large, the biggest single proportion missed one area. Now that does not mean they missed one class, remember. An area is English. They might have missed two classes in English that they got D's in. So just trying to be very clear, it just means they missed one area. Um, and so we're, that gives us some sort of idea that we can start looking across our sites and, and doing a little deeper dive into the data and going, which area did they miss and who's on track right now and who's about to miss one area so we can provide interventions. Uh, just to point out, like I said, it's about 40% of students who miss, but it's not 40% equally distributed across the groups. So um, for slide seven, you have the demographic breakdown of everybody in the district so that you can see um, the gaps that we know are existing, right? So uh, our Pacific Islander, Hispanic, and African-American students miss at a higher rate, their A through G standards, and uh, Filipino, white, and Asian students generally at a lower rate. Um, Again, not new data, just keeping us focused. We also had an interesting discussion, I believe, in one of our last student outcome focus presentations where we talked about specifically English learners. So we, I wanted to make sure we called attention to the English learners as well when we look at A through G. Um, but based on our last discussion, uh, Dr. Benitez, I separated out to former English learners versus current. And, and since we're talking about high school, current English learners these are either newcomers or LTELs, long-term English learners in our system, right? So these are students who either, for some reason, haven't reclassified over the course of years or are newcomers to, the, to this system, to the country. So amongst our previous English learners, students who were at one point, you know, English learners but have been reclassified as fluent English proficient, their missing rate is about the same as the overall. Uh, it's about 40%. So they're right in line with the district average. And of that, about 19% of them have missed in one or two areas. When you look at our LTEL and newcomer students, and, and it's mostly LTELs, we don't have a huge population of newcomers in the secondary and in high school, 87% uh, of them do not meet A through G. But what's interesting to know is it's still 19% who miss in one or two areas. It's a far bigger proportion who are missing in multiple areas. So remember what I said a few minutes ago about English being the number one area, not necessarily for our current English learners, it's multiple areas. Um, that they're missing. And now this end size is a lot smaller um, than some of the other data I'll show you. So this isn't thousands of students. This is hundreds of students over the course of five years. Um, but it is still interesting to note that, that we need to monitor our FEP students, but the interventions that we need to provide for LTELs will, will need to be different and we'll need to try and figure out which areas are the most impactful for them moving forward. So in the beginning, we looked at how many graduates missed. Then I, we looked at, of the students who missed, how many missed English. Now we said, I'm only interested in students who missed one or two areas. I'm interested in all students, but if I'm thinking about how to really move the needle for 2,000 students who missed in one area, I need to know what that area is. So of the students who just missed one or two areas, which areas were the most prevalent? Um, and I think the data here speaks for itself. It's pretty clear that English was it for most of these kids the area that they missed if they missed two areas English was still a predominant area um, to start you're talking about thousands of students who fell out in English so of course we sat down as a team and we said it's a lot of English you take as a freshman sophomore junior and senior it's for your requirement where are they falling out um, and by and large it's actually in their senior year so when you look at it about 46 percent of the students the course that they missed was their senior English course. Um, and we can talk in a second about some possible inferences that we make from that. Um, all pure conjecture at this point, but some of the things that we're thinking based on some of the stuff we know about our system. Um, so in about 17% missed it in English 9, 16 in English 10, 21% uh, in English 11, and 46% in 12. And it's interesting to note, we do not offer an English course that is not A through G aligned. So it's not like they're taking a course that doesn't qualify as their senior year. All of our English offerings uh, in the core courses are A through G compliant. Um, so 
it, it's not a scheduling issue in terms of students not being scheduled into the correct course. So, so the question I asked from that is, okay, so what's the combo? I asked my team, it's English and what? Because um, I think we talk a lot here, it's English and math. It's English and math. It's English and science, actually. Um, so it's English predominantly, followed by English and science as the second largest. Um, and then English and math would be the third largest group if you're missing two areas. Um, and you could see kind of on down the, the road there, uh, English and whatever the partner course is if you've missed one or two areas. So um, some interesting, hopeful um, data that comes out of here is we have a lot of students who are just barely missing A through G. So of the students who are missing, a lot of them are not missing wildly. They're not missing in every area they take. They're not getting Ds all the way throughout their careers. They're doing well. It's just one or two areas. And, and now we know it's English and science, and specifically English, and specifically 12th grade English. Um, we have a lot more questions, and we will continue to ask them in the research, which English courses, at which sites. Um, we definitely want to do some work with students to figure out why they think this is happening. Um, we can make some inferences. When, when you talk about senior English, I mean, I think one term that always comes up is senioritis, right? But I think the reality is, in Long Beach, we've done a really good job of establishing the Long Beach College Promise. And, and things like that. You can be a senior. You can be going to LBCC your next year and realize that you don't have to get a C your second semester of senior English to continue on and be successful. Um, and when you have that with an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old who's maybe struggled in English, it could be an option where students could be choosing to move on and get college. We don't know that. We just need to talk to students to find out. Um, you know, students who are successful for all three years, successful in every other area of A through G, and just as a senior missed English, we, we need to explore that a little further, but it gives us an area to work. We've also given a lot deeper data to the high school office for them to start exploring, where we start looking at it by site, we start looking at it um, by course, so not just 12th grade English, but the different 12th grade English course iterations, so that they can start doing some, some exploration and trying to figure out, are there any commonalities that they can look into, so. That is where we stand with A through G gatekeepers. It was really actually interesting because I think we all had assumptions and I'm not sure that English was the general assumption of where our students were um, being barred. The other thing I would like to, to add, um, we talked about the Ds a minute ago, right? One of the things we know is English is four. It's the only one that requires four years. You gotta get all four. The other areas, if you got a D, you can get a C in another class your junior or senior year and recover and still qualify in A through G. You don't have that option in English and in some courses, like math courses, you have validation rules. So if you got a D in Algebra 1, but you got a C or better in Algebra 2, Algebra 2 validates Algebra 1. You've made it. You're okay. There is no validation in English like that. Passing your junior English doesn't fix your D in freshman English, um, which for most of our kids isn't the issue. It's seniors. But we do know that that sort of four-year requirement and no validation rules could also be playing a, a, into why English is the roadblock so much more. Thank you, Dr. C. Brown. Um, you said something that's important, so I'm gonna go to questions from my colleagues, but you did say that we can make a lot of inferences, but at this point, they would be pure conjecture. I did say um, that. So I would just uh, ask my colleagues to remember that this, this information has brought a lot yeah. more questions than answers, um, and it sounds like, and maybe you can talk a little more at the end about uh, ways you're going to go about that learning, but you talked mm -hmm. about the high school office and mm -hmm. and ways we're going to learn more about the thing we just learned. And I will say I would have automatically said math was the gatekeeper. And I know this is a question that we've been asking. I think Diana can can attest that we've been asking this question for a long time of what is the thing? Where do they fall off? What are we missing? And so really grateful that your team has figured out a way to do this um, that gave us mm -hmm. some new learning. So I will go to colleagues for questions. Mr. Miller, I see you teed up. Yes. Uh, first off, thank you. Thank you for putting this together. Um, and I think the timing couldn't have been uh, more perfect with uh, thousands of our high school seniors applying to colleges over the past couple of weeks. Uh, let's just say I've had to assist a good friend of mine fill out some of his high school, I mean, college applications, and I'm exhausted. So, uh, uh, and a lot of these questions came up. Uh, one of which is that I think just for a point of clarification, because you were talking about some of the nuances here, and I just want to make sure that we understand correctly. In, on the very first slide, you broke it down by year, right, where we're talking about four years of English, three years of math. Um, but you also talked about the variances in which if you got a 
B the second semester, but you got an F the first semester, that you still are eligible to move on. I think the part where, if I can just dis, uh, deaggregate uh, this question here, when we're talking about A through G requirements, you have it broken down by year, but are we talking about by semester for certain class for certain classes? Like, for example, with math, if are, are we talking about if we're talking about three years, are we saying six semesters, or are we saying we are, yeah. Okay. So, so you have to see or better both semesters mm -hmm. to get the year credit. You have to get it's. We say year, but really it's it's a year is ten credits, right? right? So you have to get the full ten credits. So five credits with the first semester with a see or better, and five credits the second semester. And in English, there is no validation rules, right? So what you did in the second semester or another course doesn't impact what you did. So, so you could, and this is the next question. One of, one of the questions we're asking, and I don't have an answer for yet, is do we see a certain semester in that senior year being more troublesome? I think my, my pure conjecture assumption would be that second semester senior year might be um, a bigger proportion than first semester senior year, but I, I don't know yet that that is true. So that's the, one of the other things we're looking at, but you have to pass both semesters with a year better. Which by the way, uh, to be clear, senioritis is a diagnosis we don't have in Long Beach Unified School District. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, Mr. Otto, will you yeah, sure. shoot up? Um, I, I appreciate your modesty saying that uh, we don't know these things, but uh, I would rather take your inferences and a lot of people's inferences, including mine, about why this is or what we expect to find as we gather the data. Uh, you know, you, you say we don't know, I think. Uh, nobody takes epistemology in, uh, in, uh, in uh, high school, but uh, what are your best thoughts about why it is that we're, we're, we're getting what we're getting and what kinds of interventions we might be looking at before we know. Sure, I, I would refer us back to the presentation I gave on A through G a few months ago and I would say that, that some of the best interventions are really the, the on-track guides that we're starting to look at, right? And we, I referenced Browning and their um, Breakthrough Success Community where they're really focused on monitoring students on a semester by semester basis and, and then conferencing with and bringing the teacher teams around if you do have students who get a D because they know it means you're falling off. And what we've seen at Browning is actually the A through G rates, or I should say the on track to meet A through G rates are higher uh, in the freshman and sophomore year than they are at some of our other sites that aren't taking that approach. And so that gives us hope that really that, that idea that you should look at A through G not as, well, it's something we discover at the end, but something we can monitor as we go. And every time a student um, doesn't get a C or better in an A through G course, that that might warrant a discussion with the teachers, a discussion from our teams that are working on interventions. Uh, so I think that's part of it. I would say that the other part of it for me with, with English and my, again, my inferences only, um, when we're starting to look at, at the coursework, the fact that there is the four years and the fact that we know that literacy is such a key um, indicator of a lot of other success metrics, uh, both in secondary and post-secondary education. Um, we've heard in this room and in other rooms the importance of like third grade literacy, right? Well, there's a reason. It's because third grade literacy is a predictive metric for success after third grade, for success after high school. I think this is a carry on to that, which is really showing us that literacy is critically important. And because it's the most rigorous requirement, it's the one that, that could trip us up. So I think um, our focus on literacy is a well-placed focus and will continue to be a well-placed focus. I think it's one of the reasons that our A through G rate is generally higher than similar schools like us because we've had this, or similar school districts, I should say, uh, because we've had this focus on literacy and, and English is the gatekeeper. The other thing is, um, I, I really do think we've done a really good job of supporting students who aren't going directly to four-year universities. And so um, it's okay. It's okay to be a successful graduate who's going to go to LBCC and move on from there. It, and we've messaged that very well. Um, so that's the part I think moving forward, my team's A, looking at courses, B, looking at semesters, and then C, we have a plan to start actually talking to students and, and getting their perspective on why this particular course or this particular semester seemed to be different to them. Um, I mean, if none of them talk about the cultural trauma and going to LBCC, then I will go back to the drawing board. But if a lot of them talk about it, then I'll know that that's kind of where we're at. Um, so, but I need that perspective from them. Great, thank you. Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Dr. C. Brown. So I agree it's okay to go to LBCC, but we should have the opportunity if students um, 
want to go straight into a four-year granting uh, institution. So um, I'm going to come at this from questions that we're not yet asking or answers to questions that we don't yet have, uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, and I love how you keep looking at the boss when you use inference uh, <laughs> just to see if you're going to go too far or not. Or not right. <laughs> uh, so I want to, um, I appreciate that this builds and complements the previous presentation that we had on A through G. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me about that presentation was a preliminary assumption around potentially math being, you know, real or perceived the gatekeeper. Uh, for A through G. But, the, but the, the thing that stood out to me about that is that ninth grade is a restart, right? All students entering the ninth grade get right back on an A through G um, potential pathway, uh, right? And the, what was striking to me about that is that a huge percent of students, I don't remember the percent, Dr. Brown, maybe you do, uh, after ninth grade were off track, right? So I want to juxtapose that to uh, one of the data points that you uh, shared here that uh, actually it's senior English, uh, right, where uh, you have a higher percent of students. So again, question not yet asked potentially or not yet we have an answer to. How do we juxtapose that we have such a high um, drop off of the A through G path in the ninth grade, yet it's the senior year English class that looks super interesting? Uh, here. Sure. And, and actually, I, I do have uh, probably a half answer okay. for you, maybe even better. Um, part of it has to do with, with when we take the measurement. So um, right now, in this particular data presentation, we're only looking at students who graduated, which means we're not looking at any students who failed. So part of those students who fell off the A through G track also, unfortunately, fell off grad track ended up not graduating from our system. Either they went to a different system or we lost the data because they left the state and we don't get reporting from other states or they left the country or uh, in worst case scenarios, unfortunately, they dropped out. So some of those students never cover and I'm only looking at graduates here, right? So this is a slightly different subset of students. The other thing is a lot of the students got Fs. They then went to summer school. They went to Apex. They did something and recovered that F and recovered it all the way to a C. So now they went from off track to on track, whereas we're only looking at D's here, right? So these are students. So a lot of these seniors who fell off in senior English may have fallen off their freshman year, taken summer school, got back on, fallen off again their sophomore year, got back on, and then their senior year didn't have the opportunity to get back on. And, and because they're graduates, they got a D, which means we, we maybe didn't have a place for them to make up that F, right? So getting the F you go to summer school or you do something else to make up. So that I think accounts for a lot of the discrepancy between kids who fell off early versus what we're seeing as when we're all said and done and we've done all of our remediation and recovery and credit uh, fixing, the students who still didn't make it, it was their senior course. That's the one that didn't get fixed, didn't get made up, didn't get retaken. I was so hoping you would say that Dr. Brown because it brings me back to the third grade literacy, right? That um, this uh, assumption of something is happening or not happening ninth grade prior, irrespective of what interventions and these options on if you didn't pass in the ninth grade, you took it in summer school, something still, uh, we have questions around something that is either not happening or not happening the way we envision it happening ninth grade prior because the third grade predictor is still there irrespective of these interventions and or alternate scenarios after ninth grade. So. Uh, more questions to come for me on uh, ninth grade and before. Mr. Miller, did you have something else? Yeah, I, I just had uh, one more kind of comment, and this is completely off the top of mind. It has not been flushed all the way through, so please excuse me as I kind of talk through it here. So the reason why I, I wanted your input is because you just – shared with us that these numbers are based on all of the students that graduated which is a different which is a different demographic right because when i looked at this i looked at it as all of our high school seniors and that's the way that i interpreted it so when i see that these students didn't have uh high school english for an a through g requirement then yeah i i get it it makes sense but there are 
a whole subset of students that are probably also failing other classes, not saying that they were ever going to be A through G eligible because technically they weren't even uh, eligible to graduate from high school. But I think the part that I'm, I feel it is a little misleading with these numbers is that when you remove the kids who did not graduate from high school, I don't know if it tells us the true principles that we're trying to figure out from our system in which class is really becoming the biggest struggle for our kids. I guess that's the part that we're, we're looking at this A through G requirement piece from. I mean, but we've removed in a completely a, a complete demographic that is yeah. that it has a that has a challenge, and so do you get what I'm trying to say. I, like I said, Absol I, I, I knew it wasn't going to be flushed out, so don't Not judge me here. First, but, first draft uh, thinking yeah, is always gotcha. welcome. Um, no, I, yes, there's two things I would say in response. First is you're not wrong. So there's definitely a lot to be gained from knowing why students didn't finish entirely, right? Now, if they didn't graduate, it's definitely not one area of A through G. It's, it's a lot of areas that they've, that they've struggled with. Um, the, the, the answering the data question, technical part of that is a lot of those students maybe did graduate. They just didn't graduate here. And so I can't tell you which areas of A through G they missed or didn't miss because I don't have that data because they moved somewhere and finished. They moved to Texas, they moved anywhere. And those schools don't send us back the data. Um, if they stay in California, we have a shot at getting it. I'm going to say a shot. It's not a guarantee. If, but if they leave or they go anywhere else, they go to any sort of non-public setting, they go to charter schools, they go to anything else, I don't have the data. So it's really hard for me to make inferences because I can't get clean data for those students when they leave us. Um, it's also a, a small subset so that they're not going to make huge swings to the statistical changes in these data points because... By and large, Long Beach students graduate. The, the, we aren't not graduating a majority of our students. We are graduating the majority of our students. Um, we, are, we have a really high graduation rate, especially for uh, an urban school district. So we, we do really well with that. Um, however, there's definitely some kids who don't, and, and they can change some of this. Um, I would say that statistically, English is standing out so much, though, that I would um, venture to say there's no way that that would change with any other data point. Dr. Benitez, you had one last question? Just to build on Mr. Miller's uh, question, um, I know that you're not suggesting this, uh, Dr. Brown, but I'm wondering if you could clarify it. We're not suggesting that the fact that we can't track students that move to Texas doesn't account for our high school graduation equity gaps, are we, because we can't account for students that are that, that may appear as they're dropping out of our schools, but that you know, we're not suggesting that there's, that there's a large enough percentage of students that are graduating from somewhere else that we just can't account for, right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely not. Okay. No, we're pretty, um, we're pretty happy with the consistency of our data, and when we're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of students over the course of years, we, the gaps are our gaps, and they're they belong to us. Okay. Thank. You. Uh, yes, Ms. Craighead. <clears throat> yeah. So, Dr. Benitez, earlier you kind of alluded to uh, the A through G as an equity issue. And years ago, and I'm not quite sure what year, but I think it was around um, 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, there was a push to have the A through G requirements as part of the high school graduation requirements. I was a part of that push, uh, board member Craig. <laughs> Were you From back From the then? outside. <laughs> okay. So I think... As a result of the work that that committee did, there was, um, uh, I guess, an effort to improve the messaging around A through G, and uh, we did not recommend to the board at that time that those A through G requirements be adopted as part of the high school graduation requirements. And I believe the reason we did that was in part in big part because of the math scores. And we saw that only a uh, little more than half would <laughs> would be eligible for that, and which would drop the overall graduation rate. So when we see that the A through G participation has improved since that time, I think it's due to that effort and the messaging and the education. Um, and Dr. C. Brown, I would I would kind of um, caution us not to maybe. Uh, let the students know when they're seniors that, you know, if they're going to a community college, 
you know, maybe that should be kept under wraps a little bit. Like maybe, you know, if they're, <laughs> well, let's not, let's, let's try not to make that a part of the messaging around A through G, but, <clears throat> but I think there's a lot to be said for focusing on the positive things and uh, providing education uh, in a way that can be very useful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. C. Brown. I think this is one of those presentations that as you learn more, you'll inform the board more and six months from now start to formulate potentially what some of those support systems could look like, both for our students. Um, we know you don't have that in space because we need to know more things before that, but um, the board looks forward to hearing what's next on that front. So we're going to move on to item 17. Superintendent's item, student discipline. Thank you, I have one item of student discipline this evening. I'm recommending expulsion of the following student from a school within the district, student ID 4798. This student would be expelled under education codes 48900M and would not be eligible to, re to apply for readmission until after June 2023. However, student placement services has made the recommendation that, th that this student be expelled with the consideration for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend another school within LBOSD. Move approval. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, new business. 18.1, approval of tentative agreements for California School Employees Association, CSEA, Chapter 2, Unit A and B. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Is there any discussion? Do board members need want to hear from Mr. Rockenbach? Or are we good? We're really grateful for the work of the team. And here we are and looking forward to... Um, if this passes, uh, our CSEA members uh, coming up and being made whole in uh, equity with other units that have bargained before them. Any other discussion, or does anybody need to hear from Mr. Rockmuck? You know, I normally would just have Steve come up here just to talk, but I won't do it this time. <laughs> all right. And seeing no more discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions passes 5 0 0. 18.2, approval for revi approval of revised rates for use of school facilities. Yumi, did you have a brief report? Sure. Um, we're requesting approval of revised facilities use rates. Um, this is with the intention of aligning our rates uh, with the operational and maintenance costs associated with providing these facilities. Our current rates date back to 2008. And we are recommending a three-year phase in plan, beginning not immediately, but in 23, 24, in order to provide organizations time to prepare, to prepare for these rate increases. And a positive byproduct of um, approval of this um, item will allow the district to open up our synthetic surf turf fields. Um, to the public, which has been something that the public has been asking for for quite some time. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion or questions for Ms. Takahashi? Yes, Dr. Benitez. Uh, Madam uh, President, I'm, I'm hoping that as, as we, uh, if we approve uh, these changes uh, to the rates and understandably if they haven't, you know, if we haven't looked at it and 15 years, you mean 16 yes. years? Yes. Yeah. Oh, 2008, sorry, 14 2008. Uh, years. Um, that we can also look at um, some of the challenges that our community partners have in securing uh, the ability to use some of our sites. I know that Dr. Brown did some work on this uh, when we were doing our remote learning, especially with our systems uh, partners. And you know, we did our mobile uh, testing clinics, vaccination clinics. From time to time, I do hear from community partners about how difficult it is to navigate uh, if they want to do a community event in collaboration with our school sites. Uh, you know, a lot of difficulties on just the principals trying to figure out how that happens, our facility staff. Uh, and, I'm, you know, in all fairness, some of our community partners ask like the day before, so right. we understand that. Right. That's going to be a challenge, yes. but if there is a way, as, as we're looking at our facilities use, we've also talked about uh, revisiting our joint use uh, processes with the city. So um, 
you know, I'm wondering if we can also look at uh, just sort of, you know, the process. streamlining the process, yes. uh, right? Because oftentimes we have community partners that reach out to us and say, hey, can we get some help, some hand-holding, yeah. all right, with that process? Yeah, we'll work on clarifying the process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller? Juan is so good with stealing the words right out of my brain. Uh, but <laughs> uh, there was one component of this that I did also want to bring up. Uh, though I do recognize that when it comes to uh, the rates and, in all honesty, how fair the rates were uh, to date, it was pretty impressive. It still gave me cause for pause when I think about some of our community partners who, like Juan spoke to earlier, have had a hard time with collaborating with the, uh, uh, with the district. And uh, I want to make sure that as we talk about our joint use or talk about collaborations with our departments in any way, shape, or form, that we consider ways that we could potentially subsidize some of these costs. Because now when I think about uh, practice fields, when I think about folks like um, um, Freedom School that want to use some of our campuses, I could see how the cost could truly become a hindrance towards those supportive, supportive services that are helping our kids. And so just something to consider as we continue to move forward here. Ms. Craighead. Yes. It's my understanding that we've been losing money on the, um, in the yeah, as, as you look through that list, you can see um, you know, we haven't raised the rates in, in quite some time. So even though we want to be good community partners, it's costing us money. So we have to at least have our costs covered. Um, and I appreciate the fact that we're going to be phasing in these um, raised fees over three years. And also, I believe we are starting to, we're going to make available the synthetic turf uh, use facility use in January, but the other fees won't go into effect for another six months. Is that correct? Right, commencing in 23-24, and we are phasing it in over three years. So we still have opportunities for our community partners to use our facilities at a lower rate for the next six months, at least. Just not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask in advance. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0-0. 18.3, approval of naming the gymnasium at Rogers Middle School. Dr. Lund, did you have a quick update on this? I'm bringing forth this recommendation on behalf of the former and current principals at Rogers Middle School, Mr. Jeff Wood and Mr. Rennie Chu, to replace the existing scoreboard in the gymnasium with one that recognizes a teacher that has made a great contribution to the school site with 41 years of service to Rogers in particular. As a amazing PE teacher, uh, taught my own children, uh, coach and mentor at the school site, uh, with really near unanimous support of the student staff uh, and parents of the community. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? What's, What's the name? Is? So the scoreboard, the, we're placing the existing scoreboard with the new scoreboard that would recognize uh, Tim Ching Gymnasium as the new gymnasium for Rogers. We thank him for his service. Uh, any further discussion? All in, oh, wait. Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I support this motion, but I went back and read the policy that we have with regard to the naming of facilities, schools, and parts of schools, and we just need to be careful when we do this because it's a pretty specific policy. I think this fits within the requirements of that policy. And uh, like I said, I support it, but, uh, but uh, I was surprised to see how specific it was. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0-0. We're going to move on to 18.4, outdoor education program, information only. Mr. Moskovitz, this is a pretty exciting so piece of information. Very exciting, yes. I'm going to bird walk for a moment, and then I'll come back to it. Uh, so about 17, 18 years ago or so, I was named principal at Longfellow. And the very first official thing that I did was go to a PTA executive board meeting, which was very daunting. There were like 25 people staring at me. But it was in the home of a Ms. Megan Kerr. 
And since that time, Megan, you have been, you were a huge support to students and teachers, uh, to me personally in my time at Longfellow, and since then you've been nothing but just an amazing advocate for our district. So I thank you, and I'm glad that you'll continue to advocate for me personally and my family as uh, citizens of Long Beach, so that'll be great. Um, but along with that, I would say that one of my favorite uh, memories as a elementary principal, an elementary fifth grade teacher, and an elementary fifth grade student was attending High Hill Outdoor School. So for years, and many people in this room who were uh, students, um, teachers, um, administrators, also remember fondly those opportunities. And so uh, High Hill Outdoor School was a program that was in place in our district for about 60 years, uh, 50 or 60 years. Um, just a, an amazing opportunity for students to connect with nature, to connect with one another, to connect with their teachers in a setting outside of the classroom. Uh, you talk to anybody who grew up in Long Beach, and I see probably some smiles here on, on, the, on the dais. Um, it, it's an amazing experience that people remember forever. Unfortunately, uh, back around 2008, 2009, due to both fire conditions, budget conditions, the Great Recession, we uh, were forced to um, move our program and no longer, we have not been running our high hill, high hill program since that time. So you'll recall about a year ago, we came to you and started talking about our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program grant, uh, pretty sizable funding coming from the state to support enrichment, to support opportunities for students beyond the school day. And at that time, um, and I see, I know Mr. Steinhauser's at the back of the room here, um, he'll, he'll, he'll confirm that for many years I was kind of um, trying to lobby for the reopening of High Hill. Is he nodding back there? Yeah. Um, so when, when we got this funding, in my mind I thought, maybe this is that opportunity, right? Maybe this is that opportunity to bring High Hill back. Unfortunately, Camp High Hill, as it currently stands up in the Angeles National Forest, really is not feasible. The, the conditions, the road conditions, of uh, the fire conditions in, the, in that area just really are not feasible. It would, it would take a sizable amount of money to restore High Hill to the, the conditions that are usable for us. But at the same time, um, I was in some conversation with our a Greater Long Beach YMCA. They have a facility, Camp Oaks, up near Big Bear, that actually, when we first left High Hill back in 2008-9, we actually went to Oaks for a short time before the, uh, the budget just made that untenable. Um, so Camp Oaks, beautiful facility. Um, they've done a lot of modernization up there. And so about a year ago, we started having conversations about what would that look like for Long Beach Unified to reinstate some version of a fifth grade outdoor education program um, and using Camp Oaks as the facility. So a lot of good conversation back and forth. Um, and through that, we think we're at a place now where we, um, we are ready to move forward. We're working on the final um, language around a contract which would come before the board, hopefully um, at, the, at one of our January board meetings, um, with the expectation that we would be implementing this program starting in the 2023-2024 school year, so next school year for our fifth graders. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work to get this up and running. Um, one of the things uh, Dr. Kale and I and a, a, a team of about eight of us from the district went up and visited Camp Oaks approximately maybe two months ago. Uh, we were able to tour the facilities while students from another school district were, um, were on site. Um, just really amazing facilities, a great staff, very dedicated people. YMCAs around the country have been doing outdoor education programs for many years and, and they know what they're doing. And we, we feel confident that they'll be able to build a program that meets our needs, meets all of our students' needs. And that's something that we're really proud of too. We're gonna, this will be a very inclusive uh, program that any student in fifth grade who wants to go to Camp Oaks will be able to do so. We haven't landed on a name yet. I, I'm still thinking it should be High Hill at Oaks, but we'll, we'll work on the details. Um, but we're just really, really excited about this opportunity. We do have plans once the, the contract comes before the board and hopefully is approved in the coming um, weeks or months, we do have plans to really do some um, targeted outreach to our current fourth grade families, um, teachers, uh, fifth grade teachers, to think about what would we want this program to look like. Because we are, we are designing it in collaboration with YMCA. They have a lot of structures in place, but they're also opening to listening to our needs and, and bringing in place what we need. And so we're excited to work with our stakeholders, our, our, our teachers, our parents, our students, our principals to think about that program. And we're also even in the early stages of thinking about taking some of our um, student leaders, um, some of our um, superintendents forum and our, our fifth grade um, RSVP students, and maybe going on a field trip at some point this spring so that we can test it out and get their feedback as well. So, real excited. I just wanted to open it up at this moment. If you have any initial questions or, or comments that you wanted to make, and then knowing that it will come before you as a contract for approval at an upcoming board meeting. Colleagues, <laughs> Ms. Craighead. Yeah. 
I am so excited that this is before us and that this has been in the works. So excited. I was um, terribly disappointed when it became necessary for us to close High Hill. I feel very fortunate that all three of my children were able to attend um, Camp High Hill. I have nine years between my oldest and my youngest, and so it would have been terrible to live with my sons talking about High Hill and my daughter not having that experience. Um, and from an equity point of view, I know that when we send when we sent students into the mountains, a lot of times that was the first experience for those students to be um, away from home, number one, and to be in a different area like the mountains. They had never been to the mountains before. They might never have been since, but it's an incredible opportunity for kids and a very treasured memory for uh, those of us. I was not lucky enough to attend High Hill because anyhow, but my children were, and I know that we were able to provide that for thousands and thousands of kids. And adults that have grown up in this district talk about High Hill. So thank you so much for doing this work. Dr. Benitez. A year too late, Mr. Moskowitz. <laughs> a year too late. So I was telling Dr. Benitez, my <laughs> oldest son, Andrew, missed it by one year. So he did not get to go because he missed it by one year. And Dr. Benitez's daughter is a fifth grader and will miss it by one year on the other end. So we have something in common here yeah. that we can connect uh, on. I don't want to have that in common with you, Mr. Moskowitz. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wouldn't object, I don't know if my colleagues would, uh, to, if it snows after Christmas to get invited for a tour uh, <laughs> up there since you're planning a spring uh, thing. I, I, you know, Dr. Well, we're, we're gonna need Dr. To, Baker if, might need us to do a yeah. field trip. If we go, if we go uh, with these students, we're going to need some adult chaperones, yep. so we may need you to come there along. You so I think this is great, Mr. Moskowitz, looking forward to the, the uh, uh, recommendation coming before our board. Uh, I think uh, especially... Um, in the challenging last two and a half years that we've had, uh, our students, uh, particularly our most vulnerable students, having opportunities uh, to experience nature, to uh, in many ways disconnect from the day-to-day -day grind here, and what better way to do it than through an educational system? I, I think it's wonderful, and um, you know maybe start a new legacy uh, at this site uh, that other parents and students can refer back to and talk about as one of those awesome experiences as a fifth grader in our district. Mr. Miller. I too am very much excited about this. Uh, I remember my time. I actually got to go to Camp High Hill and remember uh, Mr. Kepke and all the great things. I was part of a yucca cabin, like yeah, I remember. Um, <laughs> Um, but th I think the piece that uh, was um, probably the most impactful, as you brought up, it was one of my first times away from home, uh, but then it also gave me a heightened appreciation for the outdoors and the elements. And so as we sit here and we're charred with educating our young people, which we will obviously do as the primary goal, I think that it is also one of our like underlying goals to provide them with experiences and opportunities outside of their environment. And so by initiatives like this, with bringing this uh, uh, outdoor education program, I think that that is absolutely in, in alignment with our principles and I couldn't be more excited. Uh, my daughter will get an opportunity to go, just so you know, I wanted to make sure that you knew that. Um, so I'm really excited. I, I actually did get to go to Camp High Hill. Uh, it's a very memorable experience for me because I took an extra hike on that trip. And as a result of that extra hike that I took three other students with, when I went back to Millican High School, I had a personal meeting with the principal, E.O. Bemis, Jack Dubois, who was the vice president, principal, and Andy Seymour, who was the activities director. And after a couple of days, they decided not to suspend me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm watching my daughter, who was the youngest of three, who also did not get to go to Camp High Hill. My uh, middle son, we had it early that year, it rotated of when each school went, and it was random. And the last year of High Hill, my son went, the, I think, the first week in October. And by the third week in October of that year, it was closed. So she sits back there a little 
fitter, probably. Maybe another chaperone at our spring. Maybe uh, another event. chaperone. So thank you for carrying the torch for High Hill. Um, it is beloved in this community and this next iteration that meets the needs of our inclusive, um, diverse student body, I think is really exciting. So a great item tonight. Thank you. And that was just information, friends. So we're going to move on to 18.5, approval up of updated conflict of interest code. We have a motion. A motion. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0. Uh, 18.6, approval of chief business and financial officer's employment contract. Dr. Baker. Thank you. First, um, the opportunity I have to introduce um, the chief business and financial officer's employment contract. I want to um, say publicly thank you to Yumi Takahashi, who sits next to me. We are so fortunate to have Yumi as our CBFO. She not only brings deep expertise to her work, um, the high degree of integrity in everything that she does, an awareness about all of the things that our students need, um, and such a good planner with her team. She leads so much of the work, the important work in this district. And so I just want to introduce the item with that in mind. Um, I will read the required language in the introduction of her contract renewal. And it will take me just a moment, but this is um, required language pursuant to government code 54953C3. Um, this, is a oral, this is an oral summary of the salary and fringe benefits as set forth in the proposed CBFO employment agreement between Long Beach Unified School District and Yumi Takahashi. The contract term is effective December 15th, 2022 and through December 14th, 2026. The annual, annual salary of $237,171.35 is effective December 15th, 2022 along with percentage salary increase, increases not less than those granted by the governing board to any other non-represented manager or bargain, bargaining unit of the district during the term of this contract, including but not limited to any retroactive salary increase approved by the board for the 2022-2023 school year. Paid medical benefits on the same terms as other management employees, district paid life insurance with a death benefit of $50,000. The district will make a contribution to a 457 and or 403B plan of the employee's choosing up to a maximum district cost of $5,000. 24 working days of annual vacation with pay, exclusive of holidays, compensation at the per diem rate at the end of each fiscal year for unused vacation time in excess of 10 days, which will be carried over into the subsequent year. 13.26 days of annual sick leave. The district shall provide a $350 monthly stipend for a vehicle allowance. The district will pay for necessary expenses. I make the recommendation to approve the employment agreement with Yumi Takahashi as Chief Business and Financial Officer. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Uh, colleagues, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0-0. Uh, item 18.7. Um, Mr. Otto, do you have a motion you'd like to make for this? And yes, I do. Uh, yes, I do. Um, this is a mo motion to uh, approve the bylaws 9000, 9005, 9010, 9015, and 9020 with the fo following amendments to uh, number 9000. And um, what I'm going to do is to read, with it. this is under, uh, under uh, Section 2, which says establishing an effective and efficient government, govern excuse me, efficient organizational structure for the district by, and then with regard to 2B, um, the, uh, we would be uh, keeping and not striking the language that says, quote, overseeing and seen the development and, in quote, so that B would now re read, um, overseeing the development and adoption of policies. And under C, which is, we're going to keep and not striking the language that said establishing academic expectations and, so that that would now read, establishing academic expectations and adopting the curriculum and instructional materials that meet the social compliance criteria established by the State Board of California. And under two, also the last one there is 
2D, where we're going to keep and not strike the language that said, quote, establishing budget priorities and so that that would now read establishing budget priorities and adopting the budget. And then going on to section um, of uh, this is this is a three three uh, uh, C. It would be the the, lang the it, it, excuse me um, three C is we're going to keep and not strike the language. Uh, and I'm quoting in order to serve as effective spokespersons, so that it will now read be knowledgeable about district district be knowledgeable about district programs and efforts in order to serve as effective spokespersons, uh, end quote. And then finally, in area four, uh, 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 C, um, we are going to strike the language, quote, recommending and insert the language uh, and keep the language, the word requiring, so that it now reads, monitoring student achievement and pro program effectiveness and requiring program changes as necessary. Those are the proposed amendments. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, discussion, so I just want to give a little bit of overview. So these board policy changes are a culmination of two and a half years almost worth of work uh, that this board and governance team have undertaken uh, under our student outcomes focused governance, which allows us to talk about student data at every meeting. And so a little over two years ago, we started the process of, of doing a self-examination, knowing that student outcomes don't change unless adult behaviors change. So how do we need to change as board members and as, an as a senior team um, in order to affect change and have different outcomes for our students? And so one of the ways that we do this is looking at our own policies and practices. And we began that work in October, I think by January, um, or February, you can go back. All of these are public sessions that were done either in special meeting or part of our board meetings. Um, working with uh, AJ Crabill and the Council of Great City Schools, we formed subcommittees to work on these bylaws. So these, um, this is almost, I think, the third or fourth reading of many of these bylaws today. They were worked on in subcommittee work uh, in order to protect um, the Brown Act. So two members worked on uh, bylaws uh, regarding agenda and some of the policies some of us worked on, and two different ones worked on um, our onboarding process, our handbook, which is all available online for you, of how we hold ourselves accountable and do our jobs better as a governance team. Um, so thank you to the team, governance team, for doing this work and embarking on this work together. Um, so again, third reading, I thank you, Mr. Schrumpfer, for uh, making adjustments. I know last time on the agenda section, we wanted a couple adjustments as well, um, and those were incorporated. And I want what comes to us in front of the board comes with the goals that we've set. So if you go to the superintendent's page on the website, you can hit superintendent's goals. And until we finish our vis visioning process and strategic plan, those are the goals by which we operate, as well as the resolutions passed in this room. So it's our equity policy our policy on working with students with disabilities, our sustainability policies, all of the things that staff bring to the room, the recommendations, always come through the lens of what this board has talked about in terms of our commitment to those things. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that we are engaged and involved in the goal setting all of the time. Uh, we continue to uplift the work that we've set forth in policies and these bylaw changes um, are just ways that we hold ourselves accountable and the public knows how we will operate in good faith with that work um, and with them as partners. So colleagues, do we have any questions for considerations before we take a vote? Yes, Dr. Benitez. Two questions, uh, Madam President. So I just want to be clear on um, Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. Otto's um, wording. So we're, we're going back to a previous iteration. We're not adding anything different or new? We are actually adding. So um, I believe, um, I don't have the language uh, that was written by Mr. Strumfer. Uh, so anything in that strikeout language that you see that is additional language, new language, is adopted. Got it. What we are saying is anything that was stri stricken with a red line stays. Okay. And we're adding new language that was in red. Okay. So it's a both and. Okay. Um, Correct, me, Mr. Schumpfer? That's correct. 
Let me uh, let me let, then just build on on some of the comments that you just shared, uh, Madam President. So uh, I remember all the editing that you did on that handbook, <laughs> right, and all the iterations that we went through. So uh, let me speak as a four plus year in a board member and, and how important this shared governance work has been uh, for me. And and part of my thinking here is we did get some comments tonight and via email around that these bylaws somehow disempower our board. I actually think the opposite. I think these bylaws empower our board. Uh, and, and, and here's some reasons, right, in, in my experience in my first term as a board member. Um, we, on several occasions, needed guidance from your predecessor, Mr. Shumford, uh, Mr. North, social media guidelines that we just didn't have, uh, right? The time that our original bylaws were developed, um, and in the last two and a half years, social media presence and our uh, way of communicating is different uh, now. Uh, I remember either at my second or third meeting approaching Brent and asking clarification on Robert's rules of order, and it, there was a voila moment for me. He said, the board has never adopted Robert's rules of order. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that was weird, right, that we were by... Assume, you know, I was assuming and inferring certain things. We didn't have that uh, in place. And, and I know that these are just guidelines and we can amend and all that stuff. Um, communication with our superintendent and with our executive staff. Again, a lot of things through no one's fault. We had long-standing school board members that the culture of communication uh, was a product of Mr. Steinhauser being here so long, but board members being here so long. For, so for a new board member, Coming in, I was like, okay, do I CC a principal or executive staff? Uh, and it's not preventing us from doing it. It's just uh, upholding values that we espouse, that we um, want to reflect through policy on the communications piece. Uh, big question in my mind uh, for first two years was, so how do I get an item on the agenda? That wasn't clear. Uh, to me. And so, you know, a few of us worked on making sure that not just as board members, but that our public was also clear, uh, right? We oftentimes got approached and, you know, we weren't necessarily uh, miscommunicating, but we, don't, we didn't all have the clarity on how does an item get placed on the agenda. So whether it was by practice or inferred or implicit before, I think some of this is about codifying best practices. Uh, others are about reflecting the state of our board now. Uh, and a big part of this, as the president uh, eloquently shared, is just based on the values of how we're approaching our shared governance. So I see this as actually empowering our board, empowering the communities that we've been elected to represent, and the accountability goes through both our board, but also through superintendent. There's language very specific in there that we evaluate the superintendent, right? That was not clear before. So at my first year's evaluation of Mr. Steinhauser, I was just like, okay, what do we do here in this uh, superintendent evaluation? I knew that was one of my roles and responsibility, but it hadn't been codified uh, anywhere. So uh, not only are we vested because we participated in the development of these bylaws, uh, but I think it moves our district forward because there were clearly things that we just didn't consider in the last two and a half years. I mean, we had to shut down school board meetings multiple times. Uh, right, so there's a process here on what we do when we have to suspend Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, right, it was just kind of on the fly with a few of us. Uh, Ms. Craig, had you experienced this? Uh, just checking in with Branton, you know, what do we do when we have to shut down a school board meeting? Uh, so uh, I appreciate my colleagues' work on this. I pre appreciate the superintendent and staff's commitment to want to uphold these values, and, and, and importantly, I think to our community, uh, this is what our community also has always been asking, transparency about our governance uh, through policy and through accountability to your board. So thank you. Uh, for, for and, and I wholeheartedly support the uh, revisions that Mr. Otto uh, shared. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. I carry some of those um, memos from our attorney about how to shut down a meeting before we had things codified. It sits in the front of my binder as a just in case. Um, so again, grateful, uh, as you said, for the transparency in the work. So thank you, colleagues, for the hard work. Yeah. I, 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 just to, to uh, say a little bit more about what uh, Dr. Benita said, um, the, fi the five specific changes are specific to uh, 
let the public know and the district know that the board is part of the shared governance process so that instead of saying that we're going to adopt policies, we're going to say that the board oversees the development of and the adoption of policies. Instead of saying that, um, uh, that we're going to adopt the curriculum and instructional materials, we're going to say that the board is responsible for the establishing academic expectations and the adoption of the curriculum and instructional materials. And that instead of just saying that we're going to adopt the budget, it says that we're going to establish budget priorities and adopt the budget. The fourth one says um, that um, uh, be knowledgeable about district programs and efforts and we're including the language in order to serve as effective spokespersons for the district. And that was important because we are spokespersons for the district, not individually, but collectively as a board and the public needs to know that. And finally, um, when it, the, uh, under 4, uh, 4C, where it says monitoring student achievement and program effectiveness, it had, the original uh, language had been would be that we would recommend program changes as necessary and the decision was made that we wouldn't recommend it because we were going to be the ones that ultimately decided it and if we were going to be the ones that decided it we would monitor student we, excuse me we would monitor student achievement and program effectiveness and require program changes as necessary it's our role in conjunction with the senior staff and I think these are positive changes going forward. Any further discussion? Colleagues, a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5-0-0 as amended. Thank you. 18.8. I haven't seen this resolution. Approval of resolution 121422-A recognition. Uh, Board President Megan Kerr. Uh, Somebody going to move I, approval. Okay. I strongly second. And also, I have a resolution I'd like to read. And I will preface that by saying that um, the first time, the first time I, I, I met our, our Madam President was, uh, I don't know what year that was, but maybe <clears throat> Christian was at Hughes and uh, Megan was serving on uh, PTA, uh, probably Hughes and Longfellow and I, I was um, serving Long Beach Council PTA, and Megan had organized a rally around uh, state, uh, the, the issue of the lack of funds for education from the state. And I remember being so impressed with her because she's a mom of three little kids, and she's out there organizing and, and, and advocating and doing a great job of it. And we continued to serve in, in different PTA roles and at times together mm -hmm. at um, Long Beach Council PTA. So from way back, and I don't know when you started, but um, you've been an advocate for kids in one way or another. I know you're gonna continue that work um, as your role with the city. In the meantime, I will read this resolution uh, there's a lot of tissue and stuff. Okay, somebody had a messy pen, honestly. Okay. Whereas Megan Kerr has served for two terms on the Long Beach Unified School District Board of Education, including two terms as president, providing exemplary leadership during some of our school's most challenging times, including tonight's meeting, by the way, and in addition to her service on the board, she was a volunteer and PTA member, I can attest to that, uh, in the district, working in classrooms, offices, music programs, sports programs, and green teams, green teams, uh, at several schools. And she was a member of the Long Beach Council PTA, as well as the North Long Beach Initiative and Strategic Plan Work Groups. And whereas as a school board member, she has been an articulate and passionate voice for all students. Amen. Knowing that many children face tremendous obstacles in life, and she has been a driving force in developing board policies that strive for excellence 
equity, and inclusivity while eliminating barriers to learning. And whereas she has served as a courageous and steadfast force against prejudice, ignorance, and fear, advocating for programs, policies, and resources to help elevate often marginalized populations, including people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ plus community. And whereas she has proved to be an effective and respected liaison with local, state, and national organizations and other elected officials while ad advocating on behalf of students, their well-being, and the communities in which they live. And whereas she will continue to be a valued partner with our schools as she represents a District 5 on the Long Beach City Council and her expertise, dedication, and commitment to the important work of this board in our district will be missed dearly. Now therefore be it resolved that her colleagues on the Board of Education commend and express deep gratitude to Megan Kerr for her significant and lasting contributions to the education of thousands of students. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You don't have to say anything in this moment because there's more. <laughs> so we know you have a number of people, family and friends, colleagues, past and present in the audience that are also here to celebrate with you. So we have a special treat. So we'll ask you to turn your attention to the screens. Hey everyone, it's Mary Garcia and I just wanted to congratulate uh, Megan Kerr for her incredible service. Uh, to Long Beach, but specifically to the school district. Uh, your time both uh, chairing the board as president, uh, as a member, uh, as an advocate, as a parent is really remarkable. Uh, you know that um, I absolutely adore and love your kindness and level of service you provide uh, for students and families all across the city. We look forward to working with you still as you go to the city council and I head out to Washington, D.C. So congratulations on an amazing eight years. You did a great job. Tonight we have the opportunity to recognize Megan Kerr's two terms on the Board of Education. Megan has represented the district so well with groups like California School Board Association. Um, she's also been a delegate to the Council of Great City Schools. She's worked on some really incredible projects like Educare, and Megan is always prepared for meetings. In fact, she'll tell you that it's, uh, you know, doing her homework and she always comes prepared. But I think what I would really like everyone to know about Megan is that she's been so generous with her time, with her efforts, with her resources. Megan always shows up. She's always there. She has been the biggest champion for our students, not just students in the first district, but students across the district. So Megan, thank you so much for giving of yourself, for being um, so, so giving, and good luck in your new role as the fifth district councilwoman for the city of Long Beach. I know you're gonna serve us well as you continue to be a public servant, just in another capacity. Thank you, Megan. Megan, it has been such an honor to serve in Long Beach Unified with you. The city's gain is truly our loss in Long Beach Unified School District. The first thing when I think of you is students. I actually have a word cloud that flies over my head in what you think about students, inclusion, equity, care, thoughtfulness, all of these things are the way that you have led from your seat on the Board of Education. I also think about love. You have loved students, you have loved our staff, you have loved families, and you have been a heartbeat of our community in Long Beach Unified. 
I'll also always remember the advocacy that you have done for the North Long Beach community in all of its beauty, in all of its diversity, and all that it is becoming as another part of our Long Beach Unified community. I know they call you Queen of the North and that will probably never end. I wish you all the best in your role on the City Council. We know you'll be close and we know that you'll continue to advocate for our students and what is right and best in our community. Best wishes and thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you have done for Long Beach Unified. Megan, when I think about work with you, my memory goes back to well before your tenure on the board, but to early work when you were a parent. And one of the things that I noticed about you right away was that while your love and care and interest for your own children might have brought you to whatever meeting we were jointly at together, your voice in the meeting was always on behalf of many children and specifically children who had experienced some vulnerabilities in our system or were working through some type of a challenge. Your heart has always been towards our students who need adults to really show up for them in a strong and intentional way. And that's exactly what you brought to your time on the school board. I have so enjoyed working with you, your leadership, watching your leadership grow and change over all these years but always with that voice for vulnerability and voice for voiceless. And no goodbyes here. I know that our connection both with Long Beach Unified and our professional connection together will continue. And I just look forward to seeing what you're going to do next. But I love knowing that you're bringing your heart and mind for this community into a whole new chapter. So know that I am your fan and I look forward to continued partnership with you as you enter into a really new space. Thanks so much for everything about you. Hi Megan, congratulations. Of course, I'm so happy that you got to be a city council person, but I'm gonna miss you tremendously. You've been a great board member not just to work with, but for our students and our staff and everyone. Um, it has been wonderful to work alongside you and I'm gonna miss you so much. I hope our paths cross very soon again. Thank you and take good care of yourself. The, the Queen! Queen! First and foremost, we wanna say congratulations. We know that you're gonna be an amazing city council person. However, we're really gonna miss you. And as much support as you've shown us here at Jordan over the last few years, we are definitely gonna miss your presence, but we know that you'll be by to see us. We know that our gates are always open and we definitely still want those baked goods, those nice treats. <laughs> so we love you, congratulations. Hey Queen of the North, this is Jordan's ASB. We wanted to let you know that we will miss you and you're always welcome to come back to Jordan whenever you feel like it. Hi, Miss Queen of the North. On behalf of all the Pathways, I just wanted to thank you for coming out to all of our events and being there for us and having your continuous support. On behalf of all the clubs here at Jordan, we'd like to say thank you and we'll miss you. To the Queen of the North, I just want to say thank you for, on behalf of my team for always supporting us. As this year's Commissioner of Publicity, I wanted to personally say thank you to you for always shining your positive light on us as J-Town from the community events to the board meeting minutes that you've had. Um, we really do appreciate it. We appreciate the representation, everything you've done for us. Us as J-Town, we miss you and we love you. Megan, so sorry to hear that you're going. It was one of those things where if I thought I didn't think about it, it would never come to fruition and obviously that didn't work. So good luck to you in your new endeavors. Thank you for everything that you've done for Jordan, your unwavering support for our staff, students, and community. District 5 is extremely lucky to have you, but we hope to see you at some of our events soon. And remember, once a Panther, always a Panther. In addition, we have some beautiful certificates of recognition from the mayor of Long Beach and from Janice Hahn that I would like to present to you, as well as many um, letters from students and staff in the district. So I'll bring those up to you and you have the opportunity to welcome those who are in the audience to, to join you at the podium or to say something on your behalf before you 
and that you have comments for later this evening. Are there any folks in the audience who would like to say something? I see my family is hung in there through this board meeting. Um, but Dr. Baker said the mic is open if anyone would like to say something. Thank you. Can we share some Megan stories up here as well? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to see if anyone from the audience is going to come up. Oh. No, Megan. Um, this is bittersweet. Uh, I've known you for a long, long, long time since you guys were little guys. So the um, Megan and it's, everyone has said it so well, um, as Dr. Baker said, students first. You have been a huge advocate. Um, and to Megan's husband, Andy, and your family, I want to thank you because I know you've held many um, meetings in your houses, um, uh, especially around budget and, and how we can not lay teachers off and, and other things. Um, but this work can't get done if you don't have a powerful support group and you guys are her number one cheerleader and i want to thank you because i know the time that it takes and um sometimes it's not as pretty as we want it to be um but megan has shown everyone what a great public servant should be and could be and can be and as i was telling megan over here earlier um this is a great loss for Long Beach Unified. At the last eight years have been wonderful. You made me a better superintendent. But I know you're gonna make the partnership between the city, which is a good one, even better. So like the book says, good to great. Um, your homework is to make this partnership good to great. So thank you on behalf of tens of thousands of students and staff that you've served so well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi all, my name's Jamie. Um, I'm with the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Project in LA County. Just wanted to say congratulations, council member, on behalf of all of PPAP. We're very excited to get to work with you in this upcoming year, and thank you to everyone else on this council for your work as well. Thank you. All right, we'll bring it, as they say in the council, behind the rail. <laughs> I want to share a Megan Kerr story. All right. So I met Megan about nine years ago. Her and I both ran for school board. Uh, she got elected, and one of us lost by 108 votes uh, nine years one ago. One of us won by 108 <laughs> votes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, but um, I, I can't reiterate enough um, how high Megan sets the bar for anyone in public office in terms of being present yeah. in our community. Absolutely. You cannot serve our community if you're not genuinely, authentically present. And being present in the community isn't always fun, uh, Megan. And you know, you, you've got a lot of battle scars to show for it, but that will make you a better city councilwoman. Um, my uh, first couple meetings here, you don't think about this when you, um, particularly when you didn't have plan to run for office. Uh, Megan gave me a few tips. Uh, I think I got sworn in in July, and then in August we had our first board workshop, and Megan's like, hey, you don't have to dress up for the first part of the workshop on. I was like, good looking out, Megan, because I did not know what I was going to wear for that first board <laughs> workshop. It's like, it's a long day, keep it casual. Following day, you can you know, bring, bring a tie and then you can put it on at the end of the meeting. Uh, I'm saying that because it's an illustrative example that we didn't have a uh, handbook for new board members, Mr. Steinhauser. Uh, and so in some ways, Megan served as my onboarding and my handbook. Uh, right? She checked in from time to time. Uh, she you know, passed me a little note. She's like, this is what this acronym uh, <laughs> is. So I really appreciate uh, that because it, it is a difficult um, system to navigate. Um, you know, being the largest employer in the city with at that time 72,000 students, I think at 86 sites, um, it, it is not going to be easy to learn even after years uh, on the board. So. Uh, as a parent, I think Megan also um, shared that connection with me and how important it would be to bring a parent perspective uh, here. So all, all of those things I, I, th I say because they set the bar really high to what it means to serve our students uh, and family. So I thank you. Uh, ex you know, I did all the appreciation and gratitude for your service and commitment. And I also extend uh, best wishes to your new role, city councilwoman. But... Uh, you and I have talked about the whole joint use and all that stuff, so I'm going to follow up with, and I know you will, holding each other accountable in your new role. Uh, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Miller? Oh. 
my friend, I'm so excited for you. I'm definitely going to miss you. Um, coming into this role, I think a lot of times uh, people often place us in a box of the position and forget about the human being. Uh, I'm sure that everyone at the diocese has had that situation. Um, uh, unfortunately and fortunately, uh, when you're in the role of president or uh, interacting with the community as often uh, as you have, uh, you have had to have some tough conversations. And I think I know that the part that is most impressive about you is your decorum, your ability to continue to carry yourself with class when others will not, and the ability to um, still be a human in those moments, but understanding that you represent something bigger. And so as I've gotten to watch you for eight years now, um, I don't know if I ever shared that with you, but I've just always been impressed with it. I, I don't know if I'm as good as you are, but I'll try to be. Uh, <laughs> um, and all things considered, uh, you're not going anywhere for me. You're my council representative. Uh, uh, I'm too close with the Kerr family, so I'm going to your house for pasta and wine probably very soon. So I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Remember the brown act, Mr. Miller. Remember the brown act. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to take a point of privilege and I'm going to move uh, the superintendent report before the report of board members because I don't know that I can get through that yeah and then finish the meeting so Great. superintendent's I'm, report I'm prepared to do that you take a breath and so I just have a few things I'll, I'll try to be a little more brief tonight but just a few things to celebrate and just to shout out to to our community um, the first is I want to thank the voters who approved measure Q a huge investment cue for quality, quality in our schools, which allows us to take really big steps in modernizing our schools, thinking about the rebuilding of schools, um, and implementing so many aspects of our facilities master plan. So just a public acknowledgement for the, the board's unanimous support and all of the ways that out in the community you were supportive of Measure Q to Doug Halbert and Chris Steinhauser, who led our volunteer committee who spent hours, and to staff in Mr. Rising and Mr. Miranda, who just were phenomenal in weekend and after hours work to ensure that our schools could get what they need in Measure Q. So thank you for that. Also want to acknowledge we had our second guiding coalition. I'm not going to get the installations up right now for the sake of time, but we had, again, 100, about 100 community members and students combined together for our second guiding coalition held on a Friday evening and almost the entire day Saturday. And what a wonderful experience, again, to hear the voices of our students sitting at the table right alongside adults, creating, actually creating images of the future. Um, those installations are actually out, they're in the administration building, they're out in some of our schools, and as a result of Guiding Coalition 2, a number of our students are out taking the show on the road. They're interacting with other students, asking the questions about the adult portrait and the system portrait and things that they want in our system. Um, so they took up a really, a really nice challenge as a result of feeling very empowered by the process and by the adults that were around them. I would also like to acknowledge from Office of School Support Services, um, Dr. Prelo and Mrs. Wesley, who were out at Avalon School holding the first of its kind, a resource fair for families and students um, at Avalon. They took their show on the road and were able to make connections and provide resources and have a different way of connecting with families on Avalon, so really grateful for that. Um, our learning acceleration plan for this year is live on the district website and actually Ms. Takahashi, let me hold yours up just quickly. It looks like this, so a different color scheme for those who are looking for it. And not only does it describe the processes and programs that are um, huge investments with our ESSER funds and some of our braided funds from other, other resources, there's also a tracker that is updated quarterly for the public to see how those investments play out by pillar in terms of what we're investing in in student, in student learning acceleration and wellness. 
And I want to shout out to the team at Wilson High School. So from last year to this year, they went from having seven students in their Young Black Scholars program to this year having 120 students in their Young Black Scholars program. I'll encourage anyone who's interested in seeing their, the, the Wilson Young Black Scholars program to look at our social media and to search for their social media. They put on the first of a step show. And for those in our community who have not experienced, not just seen, but experienced a SEP show, please be on the lookout for that because it was really amazing for staff and for their community to see students perform in a SEP show. And then are you going to, will you mention Mr. Twall tonight? You know okay. I'm going to mention Mr. Twall. Then I'm Twall. saving it for you. I will not, I will not steal, steal your thunder. Lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge I've had four of my tour around high schools to have lunch with approximately 25 students on each campus. To, yesterday and today, we were giving the Pulse survey, which is that check-in with students about their sense of identity, sense of belonging, and agency. And so part of this is to take the student advisors that I meet with on a, on a monthly basis, but to go out to campuses with Mr. Suarez and hold a conversation with students about their own school's pulse survey data, really elevating it into a discussion with students about what works for them, what aspects can be better at their schools, and then to ask them about the adults that surround them with the, um, the questions that we're asking for strategic planning and to really bring their voice into all that we're doing. So it's been terrific. I have uh, 10 more to go, but each of them has something ab absolutely um, inspiring and, and mind-blowing that comes both in the conversation with the group, but then also what students will offer. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to correct, connect with our students. That's my report for this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to report of board members. Uh, so reports and announcements. We'll start with you, Mr. Miller. Sweet. All right. So I will start first with congratulating my friend and previous English teacher and Mr. Natter Twal. Uh, <clears throat> I have a quick write up here. So our own Natter Twal has been elected to the International Learning Forward Board of Trustees. Learning Forward is a worldwide association of educators devoted exclusively to establishing and sustaining highly effective professional learning. Uh, Natter Twal and the Long Beach Unified School District have partnered with Learning Forward for in the past, including a multiple series of podcasts addressing topics such as collaborative professionalism, equity and ex excellence, etc. Uh, I know from not only just being a student, but now working with Natter and Christy, um, Mr. Twal works not just with his mind because he's such a smart man, but he works with his heart. Those are the easiest people to work with. And so I'm just very excited for him and wanted to send a big congratulations to him. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, next, I wanted to give a big shout out to a number of folks. Give me one second, because I got it on my phone. There was an event over at uh, Roosevelt Elementary titled Retreatish. And it was a huge hit, which I was excited to be uh, a part of. Uh, it included uh, AOC 7, and included uh, Days Long Beach, Roosevelt, obviously, and Long Beach Forward. Um, and it was an event really focused on helping connect families to community resources. Uh, in a time where people are predicting a recession, uh, we have the holidays, we have a number of exciting activities going on in the city, but there's also a lot of sadness to be uh, that is going around as well, because the holidays are tough for people. So to connect them with resources and people and create social environments that are uplifting, uh, this is an important time to do so. So I was really, really excited to uh, support uh, the team's efforts, especially at Roosevelt, the same elementary that my mama went to. So it was really cool. Thank you. Dr. Benitez. Uh, Madam President, I'll save my comments. I'd like to keep the spotlight on you, uh, it, it's finally hit me that this is your last meeting uh, with us. So I'll save my comments tonight. Okay, Ms. Craighead. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Uh, Prager at MAN for her production of Annie. It's uh, absolutely adorable to see these kids performing on stage and they do such a great job. 
Um, I was able to attend the showcase at the Long Beach School for Adults and had a chance to talk with Miss Broadway, who was very pleased with uh, Nicole Lopez's uh, passion and care with the program. She's really taken over for Miss Broadway in a way that makes Miss Broadway proud um, that the, the program will do well. So there are um, CTA programs that were showcased, like Certified Nursing Assistant, Animal Care. I had a chance to talk to some of the uh, students who are so thankful to be given this second chance at getting a high school diploma and bettering themselves. And they, <laughs> they were uh, so positive and wonderful. And it's, it's a great program. And so I thank everybody who's involved because it's, it's very much appreciated and, and needed. And then this morning, I got to spend time at Bircham with uh, Baba the Storyteller. And I don't know if, I guess, is everybody familiar with Baba the Storyteller? Uh, holy cow, what a morning. That was so fantastic. So this is a, a person who is not just um, entertaining the, the kids because the kids were very entertained, but um, entertaining as a way to, to learn. And a real opportunity to connect with not just each other, but with another culture. Um, he presents he presents stories in in a way that makes kids want to listen. And he uses an instrument called a kora, and he plays his own kind of soundtrack for these stories. And first of all, it's a it's a beautiful instrument, but also he encourages kids to make eye contact with him as he's, as he's looking into the audience because he wants kids to understand that you listen not just with your ears but with your heart and you indicate that by giving somebody eye contact. And then it occurred to me that that instrument that's called a kora, I don't know how you spell that in, um, you know, it's, it's an instrument from Africa and I don't know how you spell kora, but in Spanish, corazón is heart. And when he was talking about listening with your heart, it, you know, it wasn't lost on me that that instrument is literally, literally called a kora. And I, I just want to thank him for being a part of our, a part of our district and sharing his talents with us. And the, the reaction of the kids and the way they participate is so wonderful to experience. And the stories are great. They're, they're parables, they're, they're fables. He had the kids singing with him. He had the kids um, doing a responsorial. You know, he, he says a phrase and then they, they respond. And he teaches them to respond in kind. So if he says, he, if he says the prompt in a loud voice, they are to respond in a loud voice. If he whispers the phrase, they whisper back. The kids were so good at doing that. So I want to thank the principal at Bircham for inviting me. And if any other school has <laughs> Bob with the storyteller, I hope I get another invitation because it was very enjoyable. But just to everybody, um, you know it's the holiday season, so we're, we have a break coming up. But I wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, a Happy Kwanzaa, and just I hope that everybody has a chance to celebrate the season with somebody you love. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Otto. So um, I wanted to say something very quickly about Measure Q, which I think was a very important accomplishment for the Long Beach Unified School District. and the city of Long Beach. Um, I must tell you that I was skeptical that we were gonna pass that measure, and I was worried that people were in the economy that we were in and with things that were happening were not going to uh, support us. I read the polls, I talked to the people that were uh, involved in it, and, uh, uh, and I was, and, and I had an infinite number of conversations with people who weren't supporting it and wanted to know why we were even going to do this. Uh, but the th theme that ran through that was 
they didn't have kids in the district. They, some of them barely lived in the district. And uh, so when it came right down to it, the people of Long Beach, all across the spectrum, know about the school district and what it does and that it deserves to be supported. And that's, I think, what passed uh, Measure Q. And uh, everyone involved needs to be congratulated for that because just like uh, Superintendent Baker said, it's what we need. It's what we need going forward. We need to continue to fund education in Long Beach in a good way. So I say that about that. Um, I, on, on Tuesday and Wednesday of last week, I was as, at the California School Board Association meeting in San Diego as a delegate. And that's a great opportunity to learn their policies and what they're advocating this year right from the people who are literally doing it and forming relationships with those people so that I can pick up the phone and say, I'm thinking about this. Uh, where are you? Can you give me some help on this? And uh, that, that was a great experience. On um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I was at the conference um, as just the annual conference of the School Board Association. And not only was it a, a really, really quality conference in terms of the programs that were developed, but I had the honor and the privilege of sitting in on the Long Beach Unified School District presentation that won, and Dr. Uh, 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 Baker uh, participated in with um, uh, David Zale as well. And it was, I was just so impressed with what was said and the reactions of the audience, uh, because everybody had issues in their districts up and down the state about doing things. And we had answers to literally all of their questions. And it was just a, a great moment for Long Beach, not only to showcase, but to, to, to be uh, respected uh, and uh, applauded for the work that we're doing in equity and excellence. And uh, uh, it just, sh it really shined. And, and so I learned a lot. I, I raced back from that on Saturday and spent the entire day at the strategic planning meeting over at, uh, uh, at the high school uh, over on Redondo, Browning. And um, it, was, it was a very, uh, it, was, it was the first meeting that I could go to completely because I was out of town for the first one. There's a third one in uh, February, but I really wanted to be involved in that process. And it was very heartwarming to see the student participation, the way that it's being conducted, the profiles that we're coming up with. And I should say, not that I'm coming up with because I had the uh, elegant experience of having several people ask me as they were putting their numbers on or their, their dots on what they were voting for, uh, what I was voting for. And I said, I'm not voting for anything. I'm going to vote on this later. Uh, I'm listening and I'm trying to find, but there was such a good feeling in the, in the strategic planning session, which I'm, uh, it's, it, it's a tough process. And I think that, uh, uh, Prospect Studio is doing a, a really great job of doing that. Uh, I raced down there from there to the Belmont Shore Christmas Parade. I talked to people about that and what a, a I, and I think we miss an opportunity to showcase ourselves at that event because um, uh, I couldn't help but see that there were 300 St. Anthony's kids uh, uh, running running around and uh, uh, and and in the and phys physically in the parade. And I think that. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of, and we need to showcase that in this community because uh, they appreciate it uh, when it is that, when it is that we do. Uh, I um, uh, have a Baba the Storyteller uh, a story. Uh, he regularly uh, per uh, participates in and, and performs at the aquarium. We do probably twenty special days for everybody from. Uh, ethnic groups to disability students, and uh, it's a wonderful way to bring people uh, to the not only to the aquarium but to the ocean. I have been on that board for 25 years, and I can remember the first time that students would come to the aquarium and tell me that they had that they lived in Long Beach, that they lived south of 
7th Street or south of Anaheim, but that they'd never seen the ocean and that what a, a opportunity it was and what was, was said about Bob the storyteller was exactly true. He's a, a, a mesmerizing um, uh, mag magical storyteller. So, and, and um, I too want to send my congratulations to Megan. When people say to me, um, tell me about the school board. I, I, this is uh, not made up or exaggerated. I say, Megan Kerr ex ex exemplifies what a school board member should be. It seems to be her whole life. She's everywhere. She's made friends with people. She has relationships with everybody. And as many of us have had the conversation uh, over the last couple of years, that's what K through 12 education is all about. It's about the relationships. And so she knows the people. The people trust her. She's smart. Uh, she's dedicated to this work. And uh, uh, I said to my wife over the weekend, this is the last meeting, Megan's last meeting, and I'm really going to miss her because of the guidance that she gives. So, so sorry to see you go, but we know you'll be great on the city council. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I've said it before that when I have something important or heartfelt to say, I write it down. Oftentimes I shoot from the hip, but uh, today I needed to write it down. So I started in this district 21 years ago, as I like to say, as a young parent. Um, and as you said, I served in classrooms and libraries and green teams and copy rooms and all of those things. And I am the proud mom of lions and owls and jackrabbits and briefly panthers and rams um, and an EPHS grad. So in 2012, a lot of you know this story or so, Mary Stanton, caught me outside Longfellow Elementary where I had kids and I believe she had grandkids at the time or maybe she was visiting on board business. And she stopped me and she, she said, I think you should run for school board. I'm not running again. And it caught me off guard. Not anything that I had ever uh, considered doing. And I told her, I'm the behind the scenes person. You know, I, you call me, I'm there, you need snacks, I'll bring them. Um, and she said, I really want you to think about it. And I said, okay. And she went on her way and I went into the school. Um, and the very first person I told that to was the principal of our school, Brian Moskowitz. I walked into his office because I was going in to see him about something else. And I said, you're never going to believe what Mary Stanton said to me. She said I should run for school board. And you said, you absolutely should, without hesitation. Um, and you said, we need people like you on the school board. And I did that. Oh, OK. And I went home to my husband. And he said, you absolutely should. And it became a chorus of people saying you should. Um, and I really felt called from my community to do the work. Um, so I ran in 2014 uh, and won. And here we are, 10 years later. And wow. Um, I am so proud of the work that I've been able to do on behalf of D1 and our entire district. Uh, my predecessor on the council last night has said this before and says it very eloquently, that we're elected by area, but we serve the whole district. And we've joked oftentimes that they're all our kids, like whatever's going on at whatever school, that we all take part in that. Um, but I do want to call out my D1 schools. Adams, Barton, Dooley, Grant, Hart, King, Longfellow, Los Cerritos, McKinley, Hamilton, Lindbergh, Lindsay, Hughes, Powell, Jordan, Educare. These were the places I went most often. I went where I was invited, um, and I always told people I'd be happy to go. Um, but these were the, the students and families in the community that shaped who I am as a leader, and I want to thank them for that. There have been so many big projects and big policies. Educare was the first meeting that I had with Mr. S with Mr. Steinhauser and Mr. Mayor. I don't think either one of us were sworn into office yet. And we met downtown and said, there's this thing called educate, Educare. Let's talk about it. Um, the ongoing renovations at Jordan, the Measure E upgrades, our partnership with the Building Trades and our first Community Workforce Agreement, our Public Service Pathway at Jordan, our Junior Lifeguard partnership with Marine Safety that talked about kids having access to programs but has led to internships and jobs for our students and careers in public safety for our students, our health education opportunities at Jordan High School that are ongoing, the environmental and green schools work, our sustainability policy, our increase in support for our LGBTQ plus students, a resolution supporting and recommitting to better serving our students with disabilities and their family, and a transformational equity policy that demonstrates a deep commitment far into the future. 
I, I did the math and it's probably fuzzy, I tried to round it out. More than 40,000 graduates have crossed the stage. Um, and those are the big things. So the small things as serving as a liaison to the system for folks who didn't know how to access it. Um, and that was by text message or Facebook message or running into people in the store. Um, and my deep gratitude for staff, all of you in this room, who answered my text messages when I said, this parent, this family, there's this thing, could you help me? And you always said yes, um, unequivocally. And it always came to resolution. I didn't even always have to follow up because the parent would get to me before you would to say, thank you. It was handled. Um, the best part of the work has been getting to know my school communities and the incredible students and families. Um, it's been an honor to uplift and celebrate the incredible work happening in North Long Beach, which is filled with brilliant, ep empathetic, joyful students, filled with love and hope for the future, who deserve our very, very best every day. And they said it in the video, um, I will forever be a Panther at heart. I wore blue today. I was going to wear something else, and I couldn't not represent Jordan tonight. Um, there have been times of great joy and celebration with grad walks and championship games and hackathons. Performances, we saw Annie together last week, kindness tunnels, and so much more. And there have been times of great heartbreak. Losing beloved teachers and staff, losing students, and of course the pandemic, which there isn't anything that I can say. Other than I put my head on my pillow each night, deeply caring about all my kids, all 70,000, and the staff that take care of them. I am grateful for all that I've learned from parents and caregivers and concerned families who have been gracious enough to help me see the world through their eyes, to teach me the things I didn't know that I didn't know, who showed me I needed to open my mind and heart in different ways to better serve our unique populations. So to the parent volunteers, community partners, and organizations that have worked with me to make the lives of our student better, thank you. To those who have shared ideas and resources with students who deserve only the best, thank you to you as well. I am grateful for each and every teacher, staff member, administrator, part-time, full-time, uh, coachy time, school security time. Thank you for allowing me to be a tremendous part, uh, a tiny part of the tremendous work you do every single day. I know sometimes we get to sit here and people talk about the good work, and it has so very little to do with us and everything to do with the work that you all do. To the principals and mascots that came out tonight, one of my principals is still here. Thank you, Mr. Steinhauser. Um, Thank you for always opening your doors to me, uh, answering my questions, and letting me hang out with your staff and your kids. I've had the pleasure of serving along two incredible superintendents. Mr. Steinhauser, who I didn't know was gonna be here, was a superintendent for the entirety of my kids' education here at Long Beach Unified. He was deeply committed not only to our students and to this district, but to our entire Long Beach community, and his steady and consistent leadership helped build this into a district that I'm proud to represent. Dr. Baker. Your determined, thoughtful, and equity-focused leadership has been incredible to witness. You took the helm in some of the darkest days, not only of our district, but of our city and our nation. And your nearly and probably always around-the-clock planning and vigilance kept our community safer. You and your team have led us to the great hope and opportunity that sits in front of this district today. So thank you for that. To my colleagues, past and present, uh, Mr. McGinnis, Mr. Meyer, Dr. Williams, Ms. Craighead, our senior member of the board, uh, my current team of governance here, Dr. Benitez, Mr. Miller, and Mr. Otto, thank you so much for helping me be a better leader. I've learned things from each of you about service and engagement and commitment and collegiality and transparency and accountability. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to represent the district both at the state and national level and to work with incredible leaders to do this work even better here. I couldn't have done this without my incredible family who is still sitting here in the back of a board meeting. God bless them. Uh, Mr. Steinhauser was right. In 2012, we had a family meeting to talk about the impact that my running for school board would have on our family. All three kids were still in school at the time. My amazing kids, knowing that it would impact my ability to support them individually, signed on to support all the kids in this district. Andy, my husband of nearly 28 years and boyfriend of 33, um, has been my biggest cheerleader and my most important thought partner. He has listened to countless hours of detailed education policies, ideas. 
He showed up to cheer students on at different schools. He acted as my Uber driver at back to school night and open house night so I could get to more schools. Um, and he supported our fi family financially so that I could commit my whole heart to this work. Um, thank you. Thank you to my mom and my mother-in-law, Lucy, who are here, and my brother, Todd, and his husband, Bill, who are here. This was a tough night to have you here, to hear the things that were said in this meeting tonight. So thank you for showing me a deep commitment to love and being an example for my kids, their whole lives, of what it means to love thoroughly and truly. So thank you for being here tonight, especially sitting through all of that. I am the first to admit that I've made mistakes, probably a lot of them, that I didn't do enough, and I absolutely could have done so much more and worked harder. And for those mistakes and the things I fail to do, I ask your grace and forgiveness. I have never been more optimistic about what Long Beach Unified has in front of it. I am so excited to bear witness to it and to watch and cheer you all on from the sidelines to do that work of building a partnership that will make the work even stronger for all of our kids across the district. Um, to our teachers and staff at every level for all of your support over these years, thank you so much. Um, I know you're all up to the task of educating and supporting this next generation of kids. I just thank you for the opportunity to serve the school district, um, to be in partnership and friendship with all of you, and to uplift the incredible students and families that we serve. So thank you very, very much. So we're, we're going to close out our meeting tonight. I know it's really late, and I want to thank you for hanging in. But I'm going to ask as we adjourn, um, if we close in the honor of Keith Hansen. Keith began, became known, or he passed away um, unexpectedly last week. He became known across the city during his lengthening career at Long Beach Unified, where he served as coach, PE teacher, activities director, vice principal, and pr principal at Jefferson and Lakewood and Wilson High Schools. His roots ran even deeper to his childhood spent in Long Beach as a time, and he was a student at Prisk and Stanford and Milligan and Long Beach City College and Long Beach State. Um, he was a past president of the Long Beach Century Club and continued to be engaged in activities that supported students across the district and our student athletes. Um, there's a great obituary on the 562.org that you can read about him. Um, but it's people like Keith and people like all of you in this room who have served our students with your whole heart that made the difference. So we adjourn in his memory and uh, get, send our best wishes to his family. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Second. We're adjourned until Tuesday, December 20th. Take care, everybody.